recognition of guests, the Honourable Premier. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and welcome back to all of my colleagues to another day of debate in the Legislature, and thanks to all those who tune in at home and members of our media who bring the news from the Legislature to Islanders and those beyond our shores, Mr. Speaker. I want to just be brief today in my openings. Uh, I'd say last night I had the great pleasure to attend a fundraising dinner in uh, Stanhope Marshfield, the Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture, and I was expecting a half-decent crowd, Mr. Speaker. It was filled to the rafters, and they... They sent them home, Mr. Speaker. There were too many to get in, so it was a great testament to the great work that my colleague and friend is doing in that district, and thanks for everyone for coming out. And uh, it wasn't a great night. There's a lot of rain and uh, almost snow on the drive out. Uh, Mr. Speaker, tomorrow a couple of my colleagues behind me will participate in the grand opening of a new industrial park in Kensington, Mr. Speaker. This is something that's been in the works for the last two and a half years. A lot of hard work and dedication has gone into getting this up and running in a short time, and it's very important in the next step for growth in that growing community of Kensington. So to Mayor Rowan Kaisley, my colleague, the uh, MLA for the area from uh, Minister of Social Development and Housing, the Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture, and others who made that happen, Mr. Speaker. We need a strong economy in Prince Edward Island to invest in the programs that we have, uh, and uh, we know that park will fill quickly. Mr. Speaker, and this, uh, Mr. Speaker, this weekend is the 44th uh, Early Bird Hockey Tournament hosted by the Sherwood Parkdale uh, Minor Hockey uh, uh, Association. Uh, teams from all over the Maritimes uh, will be in uh, the, the capital city area, and I think it'll even stretch into some rinks uh, outside of the capital region, uh, Mr. Speaker, for a great, exciting weekend. It's not just great uh, for young hockey players to get out and... Uh, uh, and to participate in these tournaments, but it does give us a pretty good shot to the economy, uh, Mr. Speaker, in these, uh, in these times that are off for normal tourism year. So all the best to all those coming to PEI, and thank you very much and, uh, for choosing to come here. And finally, Mr. Speaker, uh, last weekend in O'Leary, the A&E Legacy Foundation uh, hosted a hockey weekend. Uh, the A&E Legacy Foundation is named after Ethan Riley and Alex Hutchinson, Mr. Speaker, uh, two young uh, hockey players and great young men who were lost in the tragic drowning accident in September 2020. Uh, so to Joey Dumville and to Nathan Durash, who are heading up that foundation, to the families of Alex and, and Ethan, and all of those who participate, Mr. Speaker, to keep their, uh, to keep their legacy alive. Uh, and the money they raise, Mr. Speaker, goes to help youth participate in sport in the name of Ethan uh, and, and Alex. So, Mr. Speaker, uh, touching weekend, an important weekend. And to, to Joey and Nathan and all the families, thanks for doing so much to keep the, the names of Alex and Ethan alive. They're two great two great spirits that remain with us. So thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, I'd just like to echo something the Premier said there about the new industrial park in Kensington. And Rowan Caisley uh, gave me a tour around that a couple of months ago. It's an impressive space and uh, lots and lots of room for uh, great businesses to move into that area and, as the Premier said, to boost the economy uh, around Kensington. It's a, a, a town that's impressive in all, in all kinds of ways. Um, Volunteer firefighters across the province, as you well know, Mr. Speaker, do incredible work for their communities um, every single day, but particularly after Fiona, the, the amount of work that they have done and the services that they have provided to Islanders is quite extraordinary. Dave Rossiter was here, of course, for one of the standing committee meetings and spoke passionately about what um, he and so many volunteer fire, firefighters across the province have done. And in that meeting, I talked about a really heroic rescue that was done in my own district by firefighters and policemen of a, uh, a family whose roof blew off their house and they had to be escorted to and they actually spent the night in the, in the uh, fire hall actually in North River. And that North River Fire Department uh, recently announced that there'll be three new firefighters joining them and that's Ryan Boswell, Troy Arsenault and Logan Lewis and they've all made it through the probationary period that that all members of any new fire department have to do and they will be fully fledged members of the North River Fire <coughs> Department uh, as of right now so congratulations to them and they, again they cover a really wide area uh, including large swaths of my district and I want to thank the North <coughs> River Fire Department and all of the fire firefighters across this province who do the fantastic work they do and finally Mr. Speaker on Tuesday October 
uh, sorry, November 22nd at 5.30 for a couple of hours at the Victoria Schoolhouse, the South Shore Watershed Association is going to host their evening, um, uh, an evening discussion um, on the, they, they cover a number of watersheds, five I think in the region, and there will be presentations by the PEI Agri Watershed Partnership, the pro uh, professional agrologist Gwen Vesey will be there, and there's going to be food provided by the PEI Hand Pie Company, so there's no, like, there's a reason en enough <laughs> to go to the meeting there. Um, so that's again on November 22nd at 5.30 at the Old Schoolhouse in Victoria. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as always, it's a pleasure to rise today in the Legislature, and I want to welcome all my colleagues back, and certainly uh, a big hello to the residents of Evangeline Muscush. Mr. Speaker, we're getting closer to Canada Games, and I just want to give a shout out to all the athletes who are practicing and training hard in the days coming up to the games and I also encourage anyone that hasn't stepped up to be a volunteer if you have the time to please uh, do that if you can reach out and do that. Mr. Speaker, I want to acknowledge the work of, an age, of the age-friendly PEI. This group is dedicated to promoting programs and policies that make our communities more inclusive for older adults. The organization recently held its AGM very fittingly in Summerside where one in five residents are over the age of 60. Mr. Speaker, I want to recognize and thank Age Friendly PEI on its AGM and for all the work they do. I look forward to hearing more about its success stories across, from across this island as they go forward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty, Third Party House Leader. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just rise quickly to say hello to uh, uh, a couple of uh, residents in District 14, Alex Ho and uh, wife Fiona Yu. Uh, they're from Hong Kong, and they were just recently, uh, you know, their business was recently uh, showcased in, in uh, local media. So they have a shop in Summerside, and they do a lot of great, uh, a, a great things, and 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 can to work the the So, uh, congratulations to them. They're great people, and wanted to say hello. And uh, also, I want to lend my support and uh, to uh, Transgender Week, as many have. Um, it's a very important week, and I look forward to being at the flag raising ceremony tomorrow. Uh, here and, and then being at uh, November 20th, being there for the Trans Day of Remembrance. So uh, very moving and, and touching time that's very, very important. And lastly, I just want to say uh, good luck to all the uh, nominees. Tonight is uh, uh, Fusion Charlottetown does a great job in, in town about showcasing what's happening for, for local people in the community and they have an awards tonight at, at 6 o'clock at the, at the PEI Brewing Company. So And you can go online to Fusion uh, Facebook and, and uh, you know, find out the link and, and vote for the people that, that you want to see win the award. So it's always a fun night. So congratulations and good luck tonight. The Honourable Member from Mermaid Stratford, Opposition House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and it's a pleasure to rise today. Welcome to all my colleagues in the House and welcome to everybody that's watching from home, especially those in Mermaid Stratford. Um, Mr. Speaker, this weekend is the Stratford Area Food Drive, and so it's happening um, on the 19th. And uh, there are many collection sites around Stratford, and so I just want to make sure that everybody in the community knows that it's happening. It's really important this year. Um, all of the uh, food drive goes in support of the Upper Room Food Bank. Um, Drop-off locations are Our Lady of Assumption Church, the Stratford Town Hall, Mike and Andrea's No Frills, Sobe Stratford, and Ponell Sports Centre. And I think it's important to note that in October of 2020, 2022, the Upper Room Food Bank served 819 families. That's a lot of families. It's 2,251 2, individuals. And what's even more shocking, Mr. Speaker, is year over year, um, that is up 34%. That's a pretty shocking number. So I encourage everybody to, uh, you know, if you, if you can, to give to the food bank. And I look forward to seeing lots of people out around Stratford um, this weekend for the food drive. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Brighton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, I want to note uh, that we, as you probably know, have reached 8 billion people. When I was born 80 years ago, there was only 2 billion people. and. Uh, you may not know, but the baby boom actually started in Denmark early because people were not allowed to go out, so they <laughs> had to stay home, and what did they do? Uh, uh, but imagine that, 8 billion people, and still on PEI, we have a family doctor who can't work because he can't find a secretary. Just imagine. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Did I miss anyone? The Honorable Member from Summerside, Wilmot. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I know we're a few days past Remembrance Day, but I did want to just update the House on something. At our Remembrance Day ceremony in Summerside, it was absolutely lovely. It was an indoor event, so of course lots of people were there. But we did have the honour of hearing from one individual from Three Oaks who gave a really moving and powerful speech. And you may recognize Olivia McNeil's name, Mr. Speaker, because she's a page in our own assembly. Mm -hmm. And she did an absolutely astounding job that I just thought the House would really want to know about. Quite a number of veterans came up to me afterwards saying how moved they were by the quality of research and by the level of commentary that she provided. So I just wanted to congratulate her in front of the House on a really tremendous speech. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I did shut off the stop it. <laughs> okay, I didn't miss anyone. Member statement, the honorable member from Charlottetown Winslow and the government whip. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaker. Our seniors have given much to build our communities over the years, and it's great to see them recognized for their extraordinary service. With that in mind, I rise today to congratulate a constituent of District 10 Charlottetown Winslow, Sharda Gupta of Charlottetown, on recently being awarded the Senior Islander of the Year. This award celebrates the work of island seniors in areas like volunteering, artistic achievement, leadership, mentorship, fundraising, community participation, and career achievement. Mr. Speaker, Sharda's many years of community service fit that bill very nicely. With over 31 years of community service, Sharda has been active in many community groups throughout the years, most notably the Celebrate Canada Committee. She served as a member of the Celebrate Canada Committee for 14 years. It's a group, Mr. Speaker, that provides funding to community-based activities that celebrate and promote National Indigenous People Day, uh, People's Day, St. Jean the Baptiste Day, Canadian Multiculturalism Day, and also Canada Day. If you've ever enjoyed the annual Canada Day celebrations here in Charlottetown over the years, Sharda was one of the dedicated volunteers and organizers that have made such a community institution in our city. Sharda's many years of community service and dedication have been recognized in many ways, Mr. Speaker. She's been the recipient of numerous awards, which include the Olympic Year Awards, IRRC Citizen Award, Volunteer of the Year, the Canada 125 Award, and also the Citizen Recognition Award. Honourable Members, please join me in congratulating Sharda Gupta on her being named Prince Edward Island's Senior Islander of the Year. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Mr. Speaker, as has been mentioned before, this week is Transgender Awareness Week. The past few years have seen some movement in the trans community in terms of visibility, from TV screens to election ballots to classrooms to health care. Health care is a pathway for trans people to actually feel safer in our community. Imagine for a moment you are a trans woman. You look in the mirror every day and see a thick jawline, laryngeal prominence. You see features that don't represent who you are. You see a man, but you are a woman. Imagine what that does to your mental health, to your sense of self. Imagine what that does to your feelings of safety as you make your way through the day out in the community. Here in PEI, we support more invasive surgeries for individuals as they transition, which is great and necessary. We are hearing what members of the trans community are looking for in terms of visibility and awareness. And we, when we do not offer less invasive procedures, it shows our limited understanding of what it means to be trans and points, out, points us to a lot more work that needs to be done. Facial feminization surgery encompasses a broad range of procedures to change the, the shape of the face to look more feminine. Testosterone, testosterone cannot be reversed, and so these less invasive surgeries do so much and are things that the trans community have been calling for. It is something that the World Professional Association of Transgender Health is calling for. It is something our caucus has been calling for, to which the Department of Health and Wellness responded they would look into. I hope government has looked into it and that they will action it. Visibility and awareness are two of the most powerful tools in terms of challenging transphobia, nurturing diversity, and building community. While we have certainly made some progress, we have a long way to go to ensure that everyone, everyone in our community enjoys the luxury of being accepted and feeling safe in our community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The 
The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. The remarkable story of our little province has been captured in lots of different ways, in yarns and tales, in music and poetry and pictures, and in many fine island history books. <coughs> Among those books, and perhaps my favourite of them all, is Ed MacDonald's If You're Strong Hearted. The title, of course, is borrowed from a Milton Acorn poem of the same name. Ed's book is a really beautifully written account of the cultural, economic, social and political story of Prince Edward Island up until the turn of this century. And in doing some research recently, I revisited the book and, and I was reminded of what a fantastic read If Your Strong Heart It Is and what a singular, rich and bold history our province has written of itself. If I were to chronicle the history of our current government, my working title may well be if you're faint-hearted, because on every major issue and each time when vision and decisiveness and courage were called for, indecision, dithering, and weakness prevailed. Last week, in debate over our province's failure to meet the challenge of affordability, our, pro our Premier threw up his hands and told us that he is powerless and that we are a little defenceless island in a great big world. Well, the issue of our exploding cost of living and other issues like access to housing and health care have gotten considerably worse during the tenure of this administration over the last four years. The gift of jurisdiction we have as a sovereign province provides us with a wide array of possibilities and powers to meet virtually any challenge. To a far greater extent than almost anywhere else our size, Using the tools at our disposal, we can chart our own course. We can choose the future that we prefer. Of course, we will always be subject to the buffeting of the often unkind winds of globalism, and we will never be entirely independent of such forces, but we're certainly not impotent either. And if our spirited history tells us nothing else, it speaks of the pride in islandness and the gutsy self-reliance of this special place. Islanders are indeed, as Milton Acorn suggests, strong-hearted, and they deserve a government with the same attitude. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. End of statements. Questions by members? Starting with response to questions taken as notes. The Honorable Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, yesterday the Honorable Member from Time Valley, Sherbrooke, asked questions related to WCB and Occupational Health and Safety and PEI, and today I'm pleased to table the responses, and I'll do that after question period. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Anyone else? No? For our first question, I'll call on the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. This past August, the Premier tried to delay the deadline to submit a new carbon pricing plan, arguing that he didn't want to place a burden on islanders who were already fin uh, feeling the pinch of inflation. Now, the only reason that the Liberal and now Conservative carbon tax that we have is a burden on low-income islanders is because these governments refuse to give islanders back their money. Sure. The Premier should be rushing to bring in a better plan, not trying to delay it. A question to the Premier. Why were you so desperate to hold on to a carbon pricing system that everybody knows doesn't work for either islanders or for the climate? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we uh, continue to try to negotiate with the federal government, Mr. Speaker, to give islanders as much of a break as they possibly can get, Mr. Speaker, in this difficult time with rising cost of uh, a living, Mr. Speaker. Uh, that continues uh, with, the, uh, with the federal government. Uh, we will uh, come up with a new plan, Mr. Speaker, uh, and uh, April 1st uh, it will come into action. I don't know what else to tell the, uh, the member, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thanks, Mr. Speaker, and of course all Islanders know that the biggest break they could get is to get all of the money back. That's, that's, that's what should be done here. Thankfully, Federal Environment Minister Stephen Guibaud didn't give in, and he made the Premier stick to the September 2nd deadline to submit a new carbon pricing plan. But unlike the Nova Scotia Premier, Tim Houston, our Premier has not shared publicly what's in this new plan that he submitted in September. Question to the Premier. Why are you not sharing this new plan? Good question. Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, 
Treasurer, we haven't agreed on a new plan yet. That's why uh, we're asking the federal government to continue to rebate uh, home heating fuel, Mr. Speaker, for those who are unfairly punished for burning home heating fuel when they don't have any other options here. There's a current break in place uh, that has been negotiated by successive governments. We're trying to continue to do that, and we haven't got satisfaction from the federal government on that, Mr. Speaker. Like the Green Party, uh, the federal government wants Islanders to pay more for home heating, Mr. Speaker. I don't. Now to the Leader of the Official Opposition. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Speaker. The Premier strongly opposed putting a tax on carbon pollution. It was sort of one of the signature issues that he campaigned on in the last election. In fact, I'm not sure that there was anything else that I heard him speak more passionately about during that campaign. He's since really wavered on this issue, and I can never quite figure out where he or his government stands on this. So it's a question to the Premier. Does the new carbon pricing plan that you've submitted to Ottawa include a tax on carbon pollution? The Honourable Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I've been consistent from the beginning. I think that Islanders want to get to... Well, uh, listen, I don't want prices to be higher. I'll say that. That's for sure. I think prices are high enough, Mr. Speaker, and we've been critiqued in here every day by both parties talking about the cost of living, Mr. Speaker. Well, the cost of living is high because the price of fuel is high, Mr. Speaker. Both those parties want it higher. We don't, Mr. Speaker. So that's what we're trying to work on, Mr. Speaker. We collect $34 million in carbon tax. We rebated $70 million last year, Mr. Speaker, through direct payments and various programs to actually, Mr. Speaker, help Islanders transition away from carbon, Mr. Speaker. We don't have any other alternative, so we've got to help to get to the future. But before we get to the future, Mr. Speaker, we can't starve and freeze every Islander in the process. <laughs> So Islanders are starving and freezing because they don't have enough money, and they don't have enough money because this government continues to refuse to give them back the full rebate for the carbon tax. <laughs> oh, with, with the current... With the current carbon pricing plan, this government has waited until the very last minute to bring it in, giving islanders and businesses very little notice of the changes that were coming. The current plan, of course, expires in March. A question to the Premier. How much notice will you be giving islanders and business about the changes that are coming in March 2023? The Honourable Speaker, I think the Honourable Leader of the Opposition should go knock on the door to someone who's paying $2.85 for home heating fuel right now and say, I'd like to put 16 more cents on it. How do you feel, Mr. Speaker? Yeah. Maybe he'd get a good idea from Islanders what, he, what they think, Indeed Mr. Speaker. Works. I think they pay enough, Mr. Speaker. Mm -hmm. We're trying to negotiate with a frustrating federal government who won't give Islanders a break, Mr. Speaker. We're going to fight to give them a break, Mr. Speaker. And I'll tell you what, if it takes my government down, it'll take my government down, but I'm not going to give to this leader over here who thinks home heating fuel is not high enough, Mr. Speaker. Go ask any islanders through the roof, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> You can tell the Premier hasn't, hasn't actually knocked any doors recently because he's a dollar over on the price of heating oil. The actual carbon tax legislation is the responsibility of the Minister of Finance. Question to that Minister, what do you think about the carbon pricing framework you've inherited? Double Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, of course, we defer to, to the Department of Environment and Climate Action to deal with the federal government. So again, we have a lot of confidence in that department and how they will uh, work through the negotiations with the federal government. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown, Belvedere. Yet again, we find out that the minister doesn't know his own portfolio. It's your legislation. Right now, the lion's share of the revenues collected from the carbon tax go to subsidizing gasoline, which is totally bonkers, Mr. Speaker. Question to the Minister of Finance. Are you going to continue subsidizing? subsidizing fossil fuels like your current plan does? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I didn't really hear the last part of the question. I apologize. Uh, <laughs> so, um, again, um, within the framework of what we have, we, we try to do the best we can for Islanders. Um, again, if we look at the gas tax, it's $25 million a year. We have returned over $58 million to Islanders. So, again, that negates all the gas tax that we do collect. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown, Belvedere. So, we're clear that you're okay with 
subsidizing fossil fuels. Got it. The federal carbon pricing model returns all the revenues from the tax directly to the people as a carbon rebate, which would give more money back to lower income islanders. This is essentially what our caucus has been pushing for since the former Liberal government created the current flawed system in 2018. From what Islanders are telling us, they overwhelmingly agree. Question to the Minister of Finance, will you finally listen to Islanders and give them a full carbon rebate? Well, you're all too scared to ask me questions, I'll get up and answer them. You know what, Mr. Speaker? We give every penny back. We, we rebate beyond what we collect on carbon tax. And not only that, Mr. Speaker, we have a plan. Unlike the federal government, which you guys cheer for, and unlike the Green Party, who you guys cheer for, you guys don't have a plan for anything. There's no other plan in the, prob or in the country that's even close to what the plan Prince Island has. We are leaders. We're reducing carbon. We're making sure that people don't freeze to death in their own homes. But Mr. Speaker, like this party over here would have them freeze to death in their own home because they want to add 17 cents a litre onto furnace oil on April 1st, Mr. Speaker, which is ridiculous. Which is ridiculous. We're, we're going to transition away from fossil fuels. We're going to we're going to live responsibly under our carbon commitments, Mr. Speaker, and we're not going to starve people to death in the process like the Green Party would do. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is another government that doesn't trust ordinary people. We see it, Mr. Speaker, we see this over and over again. This government thinks that people are just here to game the system. They put barriers in place as creative as they can to prevent people from getting money because they're so afraid that somebody might get something that they don't deserve. You know what people deserve? They deserve to have enough money to buy food for their family, and you are denying that to them. This government is denying people money that they should have to buy what they need. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, they've reneged on the promise for a basic income, which is maybe the ultimate expression of trust in people. Yes. Question to the Minister of Finance. Why don't you trust Islanders enough to give them a full carbon rebate? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I don't think that we're trying to get our hands deep into people in Islanders' pockets like you guys are over there. Uh, I'll tell you something right now. It's, it's remarkable to hear the, the Green Party talk about how they care so much about people. Go to Surrey, Mr. Speaker. Go to, go to Tignish. Go to Alberton. Go to Summerside and ask people who drive to Charlottetown every single day, do they want to pay more for gas at the pumps of the 1st of April? Do they want to pay the green carbon tax, Mr. Speaker, by the Green Party of Prince of Island? Or do they want to work with us? as we help to transition off fossil fuels, as we make investments in island-wide transit, as we make investments in electric vehicles, as we make investments in switching to our home heating fuel to something that they can afford, Mr. Speaker, with a stable, clean energy source. That's not what this party wants. That's not what this party wants. That's not what this party wants. This party, the green, the green leader who's yelling at me while I'm trying to speak is saying, you know what he's saying? He's saying, give me your money, give me your money, give me your money, and freeze in your own home. Mr. Speaker, I had the opportunity to attend the Health PI AGM last night, and no surprise, human resources is the number one face, number one issue facing our health care system today. A major obstacle is how long the hiring process takes. That is currently done through the, pu the Public Service Commission. We heard from a healthcare worker last night that it took her daughter, who was trained as an RCW, eight weeks to be hired. Question to the Minister of Finance. You are the minister responsible for the Public Service Commission. When will you give Health PEI the authority to manage its own hiring process? Speaker, as you know, the PEI Public Service Commission provides support to Health PEI and all government departments uh, through proper position classification and in the inter interview support, so that to ensure a fair and equitable transfer, uh, transparent hiring process. So they do this for support of Health PEI, and back in 2000, when we gave them additional resources to do so. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Mr. May Strafford. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. The minister might have missed that it took eight weeks to hire mm -hmm. a frontline health care worker that we're in desperate need of. The Health Services Act legislates the establishment of Health PEI as a Crown Corporation. When this was completed, the buildings used to deliver health services were never transferred to the corporation. The hospitals, the clinics, the labs, they all stayed under the control of the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure. This means that Health PEI has no control over the building of new centres like KCMH or the Summerside Clinic. Question to the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. How can Health PEI truly be at arm's length if they have to depend on your department's approval for all maintenance and new building um, starts? The Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I, I believe the Honourable Member probably referring to the Summerside uh, CHC, which I think was brought up last night. So our department would, uh, Health PEI would, any smaller projects they would deal with, our department would deal with the bigger projects because we have the expertise and the uh, the engineers and the project managers that help get these projects across across the finish line. Now I do know with the Summerside CHC, there was a, a delay in getting the elevation done, which we hope to have done before this winter. But our goal is to actually have that. Uh, it's not going to slow the process down. Uh, come January, we'll have that tender out and hopefully get it done early in the spring, and the project will stay on schedule. Mr. Mr. Speaker, that doesn't change the fact that an arm's length Crown Corporation that is supposed to be separate from government is still dependent on the department because they don't actually own their own assets. As the chair of the board said last night, the Empire Statement only took 14 months to build. A health care centre here in Prince Edward Island shouldn't take mm -hmm. upwards to eight or ten years, and that's what it's currently <laughs> doing right now. <laughs> health PEI Frontline has also been begging for an online scheduling system. This would allow for more flexible scheduling and more flexible ability to do veg, um, vacation requests. Question to the Minister of Finance. Why hasn't your department prioritized much needed uh, computer software that would take our archaic paper system into the 21st century, such as doing tasks and of scheduling and making them more efficient? Honorable Minister of Finance. Speaker, and thank the Honourable Member for the question. Obviously, ITSS is an important department uh, within government. They provide a lot of services for all throughout government. So again, um, we certainly can put that on the priority list and, and, uh, and again, see where that is from a, a status perspective. There is always hiring challenges in IT, as you would know. So again, ITSS supports all government departments. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So do you see where I'm going here? Health PEI is absolutely bogged down by bureaucracy. They can't do what they need to support the front line, and they can't do what they need to make health care more accessible to islanders. Under the for former Liberal government, all of Health PEI's autonomy was stripped from them. But under this government, um, they have not made the necessary legislative changes in order to give it back. So question to the Premier, when will you truly depoliticize the health care system and make the necessary legislative changes to make Health PEI the arm's length Crown Corporation that it was always intended to be? The Honourable Premier. Oh, well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think when we talk about changing the culture in health PEI, this is some of the things that we talk about. We have made a number of strides, uh, Mr. Speaker. We have uh, allowed health PEI to operate at arm's length, Mr. Speaker, but there are things that we need to do and we continue to do uh, to uh, make that organization stronger, to make it more efficient. One of those bills uh, is actually from, uh, that we're debating here in the legislature, is actually from health PEI, Mr. Speaker, which will eliminate the red tape to help hire doctors a little more quickly, Mr. Speaker. Uh, that's how we're responding, Mr. Speaker, and we'll continue to do so. Uh, of all the things we can fight over in here, over politics, and we should, Mr. Speaker, health care shouldn't be one of them. So thank you very much. Time Valley, Sherbrooke. As we've debated paid sick leave, we've heard numerous reasons why sick leave is important, including the impacts on specific demographic groups. A question to the minister responsible for the status of women. Can you tell us what the Advisory Council on the Status of Women has said about the need for paid sick days? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, the Advisory Council, from what I understand, would be in support of paid sick leave, and that's precisely why we are doing a comprehensive review of the Employment Standards Act, and certainly they'd be a strong voice in all of this, and I appreciate all the input and feedback that they provide to government, so thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. 
I balance your book. The Minister mentions the comprehensive review of the Employment Standards Act. And in fact, many members of this House have suggested that we can wait months or years for this review to be completed before giving workers access to paid sick leave. A question to the Minister responsible for the status of women. When do workers need paid sick leave according to the Advisory Council on the status of women? The Honourable Minister, status of women. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I'm really pleased with the fact that we do have our special situation, special leave fund uh, that was enacted at the onset of COVID. And Mr. Speaker, I understand yesterday that uh, the minister sitting beside me here had suggested that he would put forward to Treasury Board an extension to that leave. Mr. Speaker, we want to ensure that Islanders protected are protected, especially our women who, uh, precisely, they need to stay home with kids. Unfortunately, they're caregivers. And, and that's why we're going to be there to support them. And we will continue to be there to support them. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in fact, the Advisory Council on the Status of Women has advised the minister that they cannot wait until the end of the Employment Standards Act review. That is not good enough. That is far too long. Workers need paid sick days now, especially women. That is what they have told her. Under the Employment Standards Act, yeah, and I will table that later, so that's something to look forward to. Under the Employment Standards Act, workers are protected from termination when they take leave under the Act. In 2020, governments introduced an unpaid emergency leave to give workers job protection if they missed work due to COVID, but this can only be accessed if there is a state of emergency, a state of public health emergency, or a direct order of public health uh, from a public health official or the chief public health officer under the Public Health Act. Question to the Minister of Economic Growth. Once the CPHO <coughs> rescinds their self-isolation order, will a worker have job protection under the Employment Standards Act if they have to stay home to prevent the spread of COVID? Honourable Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Yes. So the answer is actually no. I, I don't know how to be more clear about that. <laughs> Number has four. So the answer is no, to be clear, Mr. Speaker. Workers will no longer enjoy job protection for self-isolating once the CPHO order expires. Uh, whether this minister knows it or not, I guess. Um, what is the minister going to do to guarantee job protection for sick and isolating workers now that he's aware that uh, that uh, protection will end um, because they won't have access to that protection once once it ends? What are you going to do about this? Thank you, Ms. Mr. Speaker. We will do whatever it takes, and I already answered the question, Mr. Speaker. They do have job security. Thank you. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We recently learned that the Park Street housing units, which were set to be running up or just right around now, have been delayed. The last few nights have been very cold and very wet. No one should be sleeping out in these conditions, and we all would agree on that. Question to the Minister. What is the holdup, and when can you guarantee these units will be open? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and a great question, Honourable Member. So uh, I toured the site at Park Street this morning with my staff. Uh, we we uh, talked to everyone that was down there that's working on, on the ground and uh, seeing what this, what's happening there, Mr. Speaker. I can only give you uh, what is being told to me, Mr. Speaker. Uh, what they're telling me right now, by the end of the month, they, uh, they should be ready to go. Uh, they're doing the groundwork right now, Mr. Speaker, and then the units are going to start being assembled. So as of today, that's the update I have for you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The minister was on the radio this morning talking about Shepherds of Hope, which is a shelter in Ottawa that understands the importance of a shelter being open 24-7. But his own part plan for Park Street is for people to be kicked out at 8 a.m. every day. They'll have to lug all their belongings with them all day, only to line up back at the shelter every, every evening in hopes of a bed. This does not make a home, nor does it radiate dignity and respect. Question to the minister. If you are such a champion for Shepherds of Hope, why not follow their lead and give Islanders a place to call home it, this November? Mm -hmm. Mr. Speaker, I don't know where the honourable member gets her information, but what, can I, what I can tell you is that 
every individual that accesses those shelters will have lockers and storage, whether they're at the facility or they're not, Mr. Speaker. That's why we were in Ottawa, Mr. Speaker, to see exactly what other provinces are doing, Mr. Speaker. We know where we need to go, Mr. Speaker, and this is exactly where we're going. There's a bigger project in the works. We're meeting with all our NGOs and our partners to get through this, and as soon as I can share more information, Honourable Member, I'm going to be able to, Mr. Speaker, but this is exactly where we're going. We're looking at one site for housing. We're looking at another site for transitional housing. We're looking at food support. We're looking at safe injection site, Mr. Speaker, and programming, all under one roof. Thank Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, leading up to the 2019 election, there was many commitments made to Islanders by the Progressive Conservative platform. Matter of fact, we about 123. Oh. A section of that platform is titled Strengthening Trust and Integrity in Our Government. In that section, there are 12 commitments. Many are subjective, but some are measurable and can be seen in regards to policy implementation and legislative changes. Question to the Premier. I'm curious to know how many of these 12 commitments you, you made to Islanders you believe have been accomplished in the last three and a half years? The Honourable Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I thank the Honourable Leader of the Third Party for the question. I, I would confess I haven't spent too much time looking at the progressive conservative platform from 2019 in spite of all the challenges that we face, Mr. Speaker. I think by last count of all the commitments we've made, Mr. Speaker, we're up in the vicinity of 85 percent of them being accomplished, Mr. Speaker, which all in all, uh, in spite of everything we faced and all the difficulties that Islanders have faced, is not a bad number. In terms of that specific area, Mr. Speaker, I would go back and take a look at what those commitments were and try to provide a list of uh, what uh, we accomplished, uh, Mr. Speaker, to the honourable member. I believe it's the third party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Premier. As I said, many, many of these commitments are subjective, but one of the commitments was to embrace true and open government. Question to the Premier. Would you consider your Minister of Health and Wellness needing to be asked on two or three separate occasions about the bonuses given to health PEI executives before he finally provided a somewhat answer to be an example of embracing true and open government? Oh, good question. The Honourable Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I do have a little bit of history of being in and around this place for the last 30 years, Mr. Speaker, and I have to think that even though some of the answers might frustrate the, those who ask them, Mr. Speaker, I think the questions and the, and the deliberations take, that take place in here are much different and better and far improved, Mr. Speaker, than any before. Uh, I think the Honourable Member, uh, when he posed the question, uh, the gentleman sitting beside you, uh, he asked the question a different time the second time than he did the first time. Uh, which is why, probably why he got two different answers from the Minister of Health and Wellness, Mr. Speaker. And listen, uh, the Minister of Health and Wellness, Mr. Speaker, as you know, stands up here and answers questions every day, Mr. Speaker, and you would say he gives the longest uh, answers, Mr. Speaker. I think it's the most detailed uh, minister, uh, Mr. Speaker, that we have here uh, because the issues are important, and that's why he would take uh, the time to do so. Now the leader of the third party, your second supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Part of open, part of open government would also include that data and reports be submitted both transparently and timely. Last spring, we seen some very transparent data when the Minister of Finance charged the taxpayers for a trailer hitch on her vehicle, which still hasn't been confirmed that if it was ever paid back or not, which seems kind of ironic. It shouldn't take that long to figure that out. Question to the Premier. An open government would not delay in publishing ministerial expense reports so why, why did it take until the end of October before all government departments, department expense reports were, were uh, submitted for the summer months? Good question. The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I think there's a process that takes place where all of the expenditures of government uh, by ministers, Mr. Speaker, are disclosed and put online uh, for all to see, Mr. Speaker. I'm not sure of the time lag that the Honourable Member is referring to, but there is a process that takes place uh, four times a year. I know I sit down with my executive assistant, Mr. Speaker, and we go through the expenses uh, and we post them online. I'm sure every department does the same. Larry Inverness. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it's hard to believe it's been two months since Hurricane Fiona impacted every island household. What's even harder to believe, it's after eight weeks, I'm still receiving calls from constituents in O'Leary and Inverness about issues they're facing accessing their $250 financial assistance governments provide in households through the Red Cross. And many have told me they're just given up. It's not, it's not even worth the hassle, Mr. Speaker. 
Statistic Canada estimates that there are 65,000 permanent resident uh, households in PEI. Question to the Minister of Social Development, whose department is, has the contract with uh, Red Cross. How many island households have registered and how many are still waiting for the $250? Honourable Minister of Social Development and Housing. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll get the exact numbers and bring them back tomorrow, Mr. Speaker. Uh, when I come into the legislature on day one, I believe there was approximately 52,000 households across PEI have received that. Uh, but I'll get the latest updated numbers and bring them back tomorrow. Larry Inverness. Thanks, uh, Mr. Speaker. I happened to get a call from a constituent. She's a single mom of three and has lived in a residence since February 2022. She applied for the funding three days after it was announced and after numerous back and forth conversations with the Red Cross regarding her identity and uh, request for her to drive to Summerside, she found out she was ultimately denied. But in form, she can apply again, but there's no real appeal process. Question to the Minister. What would render this individual household ineligible and how many applications have been denied to date? And on what basis? Minister of Social Development and Housing. That's a very good question, uh, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member, I don't know why uh, that individual would have been denied. Uh, uh, from what I can hear, there's very few people being denied. Uh, the ones that uh, are uh, being uh, faced uh, to travel, uh, a lot of times there's uh, there's issues with paperwork or, or so forth, Mr. Speaker. Um, obviously, I, I'd be the first to admit there's been uh, huge issues trying to roll this program out through Red Cross, uh, but at the same time, Mr. Speaker, it was the, the fastest most efficient way to do it. We've got well over 50,000 households that were rolled out in a matter of uh, 20 days, Mr. Speaker, which was significant, and there wasn't a faster process. But what I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, is I'll bring back all the numbers tomorrow. Uh, I've yet to hear of anybody that was completely denied, uh, but I'll certainly bring that information back. Larry Inverness, for second supplementary. You know, Minister, this is a pretty key issue. It's been two months, and you still don't seem to know these numbers. It's a little disappointing. But I really want to know the question a little bit more. How much are we paying this out-of-province operated organization called Red Cross to administer programs that are being bought so badly, especially to those islands who need the most? And I might add, that, that individual lives in a housing authority that this minister operates. They would know that they exist. <laughs> Honourable Minister of Social Development and Housing. Well, Mr. Speaker, um, I don't make those decisions behind my desk, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Red Cross has administered this for us, Mr. Speaker. There has been some challenges, there, there's no doubt about it, and I, I would be the first to admit that, Mr. Speaker. But what I can tell you is well over 50,000 households receive that payment. Government could have, couldn't have done it any faster. Even with all the issues that were there, Mr. Speaker, there's still well over 50,000 households received that payment within a 20-day period, Mr. Speaker. So I will bring back as much numbers and as much information as I absolutely can, Mr. Speaker, and I'll do that for tomorrow. Thank you. Morel Dona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the, the project that's been going on in Point Dirage has caused lots of controversy, and uh, the uh, the owner there brought in tons and tons and tons of armor stone from Nova Scotia. It looks like Peggy's Cove is there, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'd like to ask, honestly, about you know how wise of an idea it is to bring in that much armor stone into PEI. But I also know our own departments use a lot of that armor stone in our transportation projects and our bridges, kind of thing, Mr. Speaker. And I think. It's kind of where we're at as, as a province, Mr. Speaker. You know, each decision that, that we have to make on our environment is going to have immediate winners and losers in the moment, Mr. Speaker. And as politicians and lawmakers, we have to rise above that. We have to look long term about what's going on. So I do want to uh, quite ask the uh, Minister of uh, Climate Action. Minister, what are we doing as a province when it comes to armor stone on our coastlines and allowing it or not allowing it? Honorable Minister of Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So that's a great question. I mean, and you've alluded to the fact that the province uses to protect their own assets where they where they need to. And uh, um, when it comes to the shoreline protection, should should we allow it, or should we should we insist something natural, or should we not allow it in certain areas? Um, and I think that's something that we, through the climate adaptation strategy, we have to hammer out a little bit more. Um, this wouldn't be simply us just saying, this is what the policy is going to be. I think it's going to take some public input. We want islanders to know what we're doing. We want them to buy into what we're, what we're doing and why we're doing it, including the fact that you might not be able to build in a 50 meter of buffer zone. You may, the buffer zone may be 50 meters or 100 meters, depending on, on where you are. And Point Rush, as you would know better than I, is one of those areas that has a very fast erosion rate. So uh, a 15 meter 
buffer zone might not be adequate for a place like that. So what, it's a very good question, and I, I realize it's not a very good answer, but it's the best answer I can give you. We, we have to make changes. We're working on policy now. What it's going to look like in the future is going to depend on the, Im the input we get from our staff and the input we get from Islanders. Maraldona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and you know, I, I, I know it's, it's, it's frustrating to me, but I, I can understand there's some sort of a legal battle over where this actual buffer zone is in that area. But that answer intrigues me is because, you know, going forward, I, I think it's fairly obvious, a 15-meter buffer zone in our most erosion-prone area of PEI can't be done. What are we going to do? You know, I've heard you talk about the, the adaption plan, but you know, what concrete actions are we going to see in 2023 so that you know, we can start looking at a different type of buffer zone, especially in these erosion prone areas? Honorable Minister of Environment. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So we will have a better, better policy for, for 2023. That's something that staff is, is currently working on and looking at what the best practices sh should be. Um, I mean, there's other issues too. And the point to Rosh one is the one that everybody can understand because they've all seen it is what happens to the properties next to it because the erosion protection is there and it deflects a lot of the energy to the to the adjacent properties. So um, do we have to start looking at what do we do when, when if somebody wants to do it and their neighbors can't do it or can't afford to do it or don't want to do it and are going to have it's going to increase their erosion rate? Are we, are we creating more problems? So I mean, there's a really big tough question that needs to be answered here and it has to be answered quick. So uh, I'll commit to having something done next year. Maraldona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm going to base you up a bit, a bit that um, you, you picked on a question that I want to ask later, but that's a great example. We Now, because of the storm, we've, we're going to see more people armoring their, their shores or reinforcing their, their shorelines, and you're going to have certain landowners that, you know, certainly can't afford the, the massive expense kind of thing. So I guess you got to answer that, but uh, let me change it to a different type of thing. So in our most erosion prone areas, in our most sensitive habitats, what about, you know, the, the uh, you know, the, the natural habitat shorefront protection solutions, right? Like, you know, uh, Minister, we've been there, you know that area uh, better than, you know, than most. Like, what is it, uh, are we going to get to a point where we say no, in these areas you could only put a natural habitat shoreline protection in? <coughs> Honorable Minister of Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, yeah, quick answers. I suspect yes, that we will. And from our department's perspective, we would be very interested in uh, in it all being natural if we if we could. So, and we understand that that's not always going to be possible. And and we want to be careful that we're not, you know, when, when we have to protect the Hillsborough Bridge, for example, with with armor stone, that we're not saying, well, we're going to do it, but you're not you're not going to be allowed to do it. So we have to be able to to thread the needle and and uh, and at least justify why we are doing it to protect those those very important assets that we would have protected. Um, but I, th I think the short answer to your question is, yeah, if we can at all, we, we would like to be 100% natural. And I think there's lots of examples all over the world where people are able to do it in a natural way. And uh, I think we have to start incorporating those in Prince Royal. Morale Dona. Mr. Speaker, uh, what you, you had answered in a previous uh, uh, question period to, to the, uh, the, the member across about, you know, different solutions for different areas, different, uh, you know, different types of buffer zones in, you know, depending on, on how serious of a situation it is, and, and certainly, you know, obviously working with the UPI Center for Climate Change is, is a good example to, to how to identify that. Can you kind of give me a, a better idea of how you see that rolling out? Who's going to be involved and who's going to make those decisions? And honestly, Minister, as you know, time is is of the essence kind of thing, you know, like we, you have your adaptation plan now, but what's going to be the rollout of actually saying, yeah, we are concerned with these areas and no longer that's going to be a 15 meter zone. We need to in expand that. Donable Minister of Environment. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So I think first there's a couple of departments, myself and the, the Department of Agriculture and Land, who would be the, the leaders from a government perspective, but we would also look to, to UPEI. We would look to other experts that are out there to kind of take part in the, in the process for us. Uh, to make sure that we build a, a plan that, that's adequate. And when I talk about some areas having rules and others, I always revert to the one that everybody knows, which is Savage Harbor. So Savage Harbor has a, probably the fastest erosion rate on Prince Edward Island versus, you know, maybe the Rudinell River doesn't or, or maybe the Mill River doesn't. So that you might be able to build closer in the Mill River. You may have different rules in the Mill River than, than may apply in Savage Harbor, and we may not even be able to build there. There might be a come a point in time where we say that's not even a place where we're going to allow you to build anymore because we know what's going to happen there over the next 50 years. Um, so there's going to be some tough conversations, but we're going to do it with between our departments and the expertise <coughs> we can draw from uh, from the island community. 
Morel Donut. Mr. Speaker, I'm going to just switch a little bit. So, so say someone submits a permit uh, to the department, a uh, building application permit, and they lay out what their plan's going to be. It's approved because it's within the rules of the province. But then after the fact that that bill doesn't go exactly the way the permit may have said, do we have uh, a check there in our system to make sure that the department is going back out and making sure that something happens, you know, someone's not going in and then all of a sudden you know, doing work that's not supposed to be done? Do we have a check? Because I know of the backlog in our, in our province and I know about the backlogs with, with permitting. Do we have the resources to do that, have that check to go back in and make sure things are being done according to the application for the permit? Honourable Minister of Environment. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So I can only speak to the water course part of it, but we, we've uh, staffed up, so we have more staff than we previously had. So any of the work that would involve working in a buffer zone, work along a water course, delineating land that could be, you know, swampy land, we still have people who want to be able to build on land that we would consider wetland, and we would send staff out to, to delineate it. Um, we would be very, very prudent on our side to make sure that we went out and, and checked back. Um, I mean, obviously, as we found in some situations, you can never be up to some of the people that are are doing the work and we saw that in the Cohead Bay situation where nothing was going to stop even visits by my department and visits from, from Justice there was never really anything that was going to stop that one individual from doing what he had he had done so uh, part of that is the changes that are coming and how we would uh, have a fining structure that would fine to a higher level and we know that won't be a full deterrent but we certainly hope it's going to deter a lot more people than it does now. Thank you Mr. Speaker. Donna. Thank you Mr. Speaker. One of my frustrations with Point Garage is, is that what it looks like is they, they you know, dug out a cliff and then they're recreating a cliff and, and how there's a, a, you know, what feels like a legal dispute over that. But going forward, for example, there's all kinds of spots where we've had significant erosion of our, of our north side or, or a number of different areas from Fiona and we're going to see that based on just regular erosion, but also the storms that are hitting PEI. So what are we going to do as a province to say, are we going to allow people to rebuild cliffs that are already there when we know that they're probably going to be destroyed, or if they do try and rearmor it, it's only going to affect people. So I, it's a tricky question to ask, but like what, what are we going to do? Are we going to allow people to start rebuilding land and PEI when we know that we're going to be faced with this over and over again? Honorable Minister of Environment. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, yeah, there's kind of a, yeah, <laughs> there's kind of a loophole that's there that allows them currently. We, I'm not, not sure that we would necessarily want them to, but we have nothing to stop them at, at this point. Um, until we get a better policy in place, which, as we all know, it's very hard to find somebody to come do that type of work right now anyway, so we may be able to get a policy in place before some of that work can happen. So we'd want to have a closer look. And, and when I talked earlier about the, the the haves and the have-nots on the coastline, the people that can afford to do, do this and the people that can't, when you look at the Point Drosh situation and you talk about how the, the bank had been dug out, that was designed by a coastal engineer. So, I mean, that's even the next level of, of affordability that I would think that the average islander who, who lives along the water and has protocol and is going to be able to help prevent that in the future. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. I really enjoyed listening to this conversation, and <clears throat> the Minister just talked about uh, policy within government. And the policy on, uh, on shoreline protection is found in the, in the Coastal Property Guide, and, and it says in the section which, which is talking about what are my options um, when dealing with adapting to coastal risk. And, and it says so three options. Firstly, is do nothing and surrender your property. The second one is to relocate existing buildings or make sure that new buildings are moved in land or the third one is to try and reduce the erosion rate by armoring just what we're talking about here so the pei department of government in block letters in the coastal guide says do the the, the department of environment does not recommend the use of shoreline stabilization the the government and the department does however recommend locating new buildings and relocating existing buildings further inland so question to the minister of environment why are you not following the existing policy which is so clear on this issue. Speaker, so I think you answered your question when you said recommends. There's not, there's no outlaw, or we, it's not outlawed, so there's no policy that says you can't do it. Our department recommends that you don't because you're going to float away to sea, which we saw how does this float away to sea during Fiona. I think the issue is more the fact that that's why they don't recommend because you're going to pay for it with the damage to your property. And we, uh, there's a story last night about the Hebrides. There's a great example of, of they probably shouldn't have been there. And if they had followed the advice of the Department of Environment through the document that you reference, they, they probably would have had better protection from it. So it's for your protection. It's not for ours. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.
Summerside Wilmot, final question. Mr. Speaker, we've heard a lot about the big government surplus this year, and for the last year, I have been raising the need to expand legal aid to include people who desperately need it. Right now, a person working full-time would have to be making less than minimum wage to have access to it, and even if they could access to it, the scope of things they'd be allowed to help with is severely limited. To the Minister of Justice and Public Safety, with an with the surplus this year, will government be more interested in improving access to justice or just improving their bottom line? Justice, safety. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker and Honourable Member. Uh, I'm working with uh, my department right now. We've discussed that. We're willing to work with uh, all Islanders to ensure that they do have the justice that they need. End of question period. Statements by ministers. Presenting and receiving petitions. The Honorable Minister or Member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg leave to present a petition from Concerned Island Citizens. I move seconded by the Honorable Member from Mermaid Stratford that the petition be now received and do lie on the table. Shall it carry? carry. Mr. Speaker, this petition states, the Island Regulatory and Appeals Commission, IRAC, has set the 2023 maximum allowable rent increase at 5.2% for unheated units and 10.8% for units heated with oil, the highest amount on record at a time when PEI is in a housing crisis with the already rising rents and growing homelessness. Tenants are disproportionately lower income and many cannot afford a sharp increase in rent without sacrificing other basic needs such as food, medicine and heat. Unaffordable rent increases threaten tenants' rights to adequate shelter, and higher rents will also mean less disposable income for tenants to spend locally and will make it more difficult for islanders to stay and live comfortably in their communities. There are 929 signatures on this petition, as well as in the tabling of documents. I have an additional uh, 266, which gives us a grand total of, I believe, 1,255. I lost my number, but I will double check that. Um, and I would like to take this opportunity to thank um, the PI Fight for Affordable Housing and Connor Kelly and his role there, Charlottetown Mutual Aid, the Cooper Institute, and many individuals, and t too many to name, but I will mention Bill Trainer as, as uh, and Barbara McDowell as they um, went around and and did a really great job for their community. So, uh, Mr. Speaker, the petition prays for the legisl Legislative Assembly to urge the government of Prince Edward Island to amend the current rental of Residential Property Act to set the to set aside the IRAC order establishing the allowable rent increase for 2023, and two, to include a legislative cap on allowable rent increases in the proposed Residential Tenancy Act to prevent these high rent increases into the future. And while I recognize that the Residential Tenancy Act is coming and we do have those caps, um, I wanted to just show you the work that, that the community was doing and how important this is. Um, and so, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Tabling of documents, the Honorable Minister of Social Development and Housing. Mr. Speaker, by leave the House, I beg leave to table um, all the capital repa repairs for all our government uh, buildings. Now, I will apologize to the Honorable Member that I think when this was printed off, there's one column that is left out um, of all the... Uh, the capital projects, but where they're going, I think there's been a, a cutoff. So I got to bring that back tomorrow, but I want to table what I have. And I move, second by the Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism, and Culture, that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Thank you. Carey. The Honorable Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism, and Culture. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I beg to table. Uh, uh, answers to questions taken in uh, by notice on um, regards to WCB and occupational health and safety on PEI, and I move seconded by the Minister of Finance that the said document do, be now received and do lie on the table. Shall it carry? Yeah. The Honourable Member from Tyne Valley, Sherbrooke. 
Mr. Speaker, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table a correspondence email that uh, highlights the recommendations provided to the Minister for the Status of Women from the Advisory Council uh, on the status of women uh, regarding the paid sick leave legislation. And I move seconded by Summerside Wilmot that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Charlotte Carey. Carey. Charlottetown Victoria Park. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. By leave of the House, I beg leave to table um, uh, some photocopied versions of the petition. And I move seconded by the member from Charlottetown Belvedere that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. There are 366 on this, giving us a grand total of 1,255 signatures from concerned islanders. Thank Charlotte Carey. Carey. Charlottetown Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. By leave of the House, I beg leave to table a letter from Animal Justice. Uh, PEI should ban no pets rules in rental housing, and we have our opportunity to do so right now with the Residential Tenancy Act. And I move seconded by the member from Charlottetown Belvedere that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Michelle Carey. The Honorable Member from Charlottetown West Road. Oh, sorry. Any more table do documents? Reports by committees. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty, Third Party House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As Chair of the Standing Committee on Health and Social Development, I beg leave to introduce the report of the said committee on Motion 97 referring Bill 49, Supported Decision Making Agreement Act, to committee. And I move seconded by the Leader of the Third Party that the same be now received and do lie on the table. <laughs> Pursuant to Rule 110.5 of the Rules of the Legislative Assembly of Prince Edward Island, I'll be moving the motion for adoption of the report Friday, November 18, 2022. Sean Carey. Carey. No more reports. <clears throat> Introduction of government bills. Government motions, orders of the day, government, the Honorable Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move by the Minister of Environment, Energy, and Climate Action that the first order of the day be now read. Shall it carry? Order number one, consideration of the capital estimates in committee. The Honourable Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move seconded by the Minister of Environment, Energy, and Climate Action that this House to now resolve itself into committee of the whole House to take into consideration grant of capital supply to His Majesty. Shall it carry? The Honourable Member from Tignesh Palmer Road, Deputy Speaker, the Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, please. The House is now on a committee of the whole House to consider the grant of capital supply to His Majesty. The request has been made to bring a stranger onto the floor. Shall it be granted? granted. Honourable members, we are on page 25, capital expenditure, transportation and infrastructure. The section capital improvements, highways has been read and is currently under debate. So on my list, um, 
Would you please state your name and position for Hansard? Gordon McFadgen, Executive Director of Fiscal Management. Thank you very much and welcome back, Gordon. So, going back to yesterday's list, I have Charlottetown Belvedere, O'Leary Inverness, and Charlottetown Victoria Park. Charlottetown Belvedere? I have finished my questions. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> O'Leary Inverness? On the bridge uh, renewal handout there, I've asked this question lots of times and I've kind of given up on a couple of bridges, but I know there's one particular bridge that uh, I'm told that's over the next five years it is uh, going to be done. It's called the Biddeford Bridge. And uh, I know there were some issues around rerouting the road and things of that nature, but I was wondering if is, is it in the five-year budget? I know you're probably, probably watching or listening back there and maybe I'll get an update at some point, but I... I guess I'd like to get an update on the Biddeford Bridge and when it will be uh, scheduled to commence construction. Um, yeah, the information that, that I have is that it is indeed on the list to be completed, um, not this year, 22-23, but in uh, subsequent years. Um, it was part of the um, projects put forward under the Build Canada Fund, so that kind of, I think we got a two-year extension to that into 2026. So. Um, it will be wrapped up prior to the conclusion of that particular funding stream. Paul Arian Vernas. Thanks. Uh, I appreciate that. That's one of the best, better updates I've had. <laughs> so appreciate that. Thanks. But no okay. more. Charlottetown Victoria Park. I had you on my list from yesterday. I didn't know if you wanted to continue or not. No. Okay. Charlottetown Brighton. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I have a few questions on active uh, transportation. Uh, which in general we, we obviously have seen great advances in. But uh, I want to know if you do consult with and communicate with community groups like uh, bike-friendly communities or PEI to determine priorities for, for the work. Um, yes, this, um, this particular program has two components, the, the capital component that's here today that uh, works on the, uh, the roads and, and uh, uh, pathways controlled by, by the province. Um, there's also a grant portion in the operating budget um, for which if there were trails and sections of trails that uh, that aren't part of the uh, the road work infrastructure that can be uh, worked on through there. Charlottetown Brighton. Uh, thank you. So is the money for this fund tied to carbon tax revenues? Uh, I know they were right. initially, but I don't know. No, no this is just a, a straight program uh, for the department. Charlottetown Brighton. So uh, I'm a little bit concerned that the uh, the spending seems to go down. Uh, why not continue the popular 3.9 million annual spending or even increase it? It seems like everybody's calling for it. Everybody likes it. Uh, yeah, this is just uh, part of the overall what what the, the department can can get done and, and sort of with the plan that they have. Um, I suspect that um, the unevenness of the cash flow relates to the sections that are getting done at any one point in time. And uh, as uh, future priorities come up, I, I'm sure the, the budget will match commensurate to the priorities. Sure, I'm right. So is uh, paving shoulders on the road, is that included in that budget or is that on the paving? Uh, it depends on the particular project. If the a, a section of road was scheduled to be to be done in part of the uh, the upgrade for the for the roads part, they would uh, and could consider uh, paving of the shoulder. Um, but the, the, this particular section would be going at and trying to link up trails to have have the flow uh, uh, better than than it is today. Charlottetown Brighton. So I noticed on some of the roads that you just added. Just paved the shoulders. That would be on the active transportation. Generally, that would be if part I of that project. Right, yeah. Yes. So, Charlottetown Brighton. So, do you have any any number on uh, how many, how much you are spending on on paving the shoulders when you do new road work? Or uh, no, they no. wouldn't. I don't have any information on the breakdown of that part versus the actual road surface part. So, so do they get Charlottetown Brighton? Sorry, uh, do they get? Uh, as a matter of course, paved, or is it only on selective roads that you pave the shoulder? Uh, I, I'm not sure on what the, the process is for determining where uh, a paved shoulder. I, I suspect it's with uh, 
the amount of right away and, and the ditch um, infrastructure that's there um, and the amount of water that we're trying to manage uh, with each roadway. So I suspect it's on a case by case basis. Charlotte, I'm Brighton. So I'm a, I don't bicycle that much anymore, but I'm a, I was a bicyclist when I lived in Denmark and uh, it seems to me a lot of the bicycle paths are sort of a, decidedly designed by a highway engineer where I can look and see options that uh, where the bicycle shouldn't follow the road, which is not really the ideal situation. And, uh, what do we do about that? Uh, is there anybody, uh, any budget for bicycle paths being designed by, say, a landscape architect or somebody who is not a highway engineer? Uh, I, I'm not aware exactly who's doing the engineering for these particular projects. Um, um, I, I'm not sure that if we have a landscape architect per se at the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure, but um, again, we're, we're kind of working with the road infrastructure that we have. Uh, anytime you're trying to carve a new pathway through, you're looking at uh, trying to get on um, you know, private property and, and working with landowners and that to uh, to try to uh, you know change the trail or put a new path through. So, you know, I think the the first step is trying to kind of make a safe pathway with the existing infrastructure that we have. Um, as I had indicated through the through the grant side, I, I'm aware that PEI Cycling Association has received projects under in the past to uh, upgrade trails that wouldn't be road work. Um, so I think. Together, I think it's it, it's a you know a plan that started a few years ago and, and is is really coming into its own. Charles and Brighton. When you look at many roads in the country, there really isn't space enough a pathway within the given right of way. The uh, road is narrow. Now there's deep ditches on either side. There's really no way for the bicyclists to go. But I was just thinking, looking at the. Uh, the power lines coming through, that really what we need is a right away on the other side of the power line that would be an excellent place for an active transportation route, but also a place where maritime electric can come and <coughs> trim trees so that you get the required setback from the power lines you need. Um, this obviously doesn't have anything to do with today's budget. I'm just can't help but commenting on it. Excuse me, Chair. Um, but that would be uh, really the, by far the best place because you want active transportation as far away from cars and trucks as possible, not as close as possible. So, um, capital improvements buildings, that, are, we, are we talking about that now, No, nope, we're in capital improvements highways. Oh, not buildings. Okay. okay. Charlotte, sorry, Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. Um, so I just want to touch a little bit on active transportation. So, um, well, first of all, what I'd like to know is, so we're about, I think, two years into the road widening as a solution for making roads safer for cyclists and and pedestrians. I'm wondering if we've gone out to like typically when you start spending money on a certain project, you would go back out then to assess whether you've achieved the goals that you were trying to achieve in the first place. Have we gone out to any kind of public, um, got, have we gotten any kind of public feedback on the users of those widened roads to see if they feel like this is actually um, addressing their concerns in the first place? I'm not aware of the evaluation process used by the department for uh, for this particular um, active transportation or network plan. Mermaid Stratford. Okay, and that would be like you know, if we had a capital project and then we'd want to measure the outcomes. Are we achieving what we set out to do in the first place? I would think that that would be one measurement of um, performance that we could measure. So anyway, so when I ask questions around that like those are the kinds of things that I'm wondering do we in year one or year two year three etc go out and figure out if the money that we've spent had its intended impact 
Um, and if it didn't, then should we just keep doing the same thing over and over again if it wasn't actually making it feel like it's safer for cyclists? So I will. that's a comment. Um, and now I'd like to ask about a specific piece of road in, that's in my district, and I'm wondering if this is in the upcoming budget because it's for collector, collector roads or collector highways. And I don't know if this one would be considered a collector, but it's the Bunbury Road from the Fort Augustus roundabout into Stratford. And I'm wondering if that is on the list of projects for this year. Good question. I, I'd have to go down this very detailed list to see if I can. There, I see the Bunbury Road on here, um, Route 21, um, for asphalt resurfacing, um, but I'm not sure what the scope of the work is um, to be completed there. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. Does it tell you a certain number of kilometers? Uh, no. Or any detail like that? No. Okay. Just Mermaid Stratford. It's on the list to get done. Okay. I will leave it at that. I would assume that that's the piece I'm talking about. So thank you very much. Oh, yeah, no, uh, no, no, I do have one more question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, do you also have a list of roads um, that would be um, slated for highway improvement um, that's fairly detailed? So if I mentioned another one, would you be able to tell if that's on the capital plan? And the reason why I ask this is because the road supervisor has submitted this particular piece of road over and over again and it seems to have been missed but on the Fort Augustus Road if there's a section there that is being resurfaced as well um, again the, the information I have is that there's an annual sort of uh, review of the condition of the roads conducted each spring after breakup um, and they would kind of assess um, based on the, you know the budget available and, and, and the work to be completed you know which sections are going to be completed so if he indicated that he's aware and it's on the list i assume it's on the list yeah. um there were just others that were in poor condition at the time okay. Mermaid stratford i'm good thanks chair charlottetown west royalty uh thank you chair um just uh want to, uh, to touch on active transportation um as well and um this has been great. I mean, a lot of people are using the active transportation trails and, and that set up that were incredibly important in, in my community. Um, where, I, where I just wanted to kind of have a discussion really was about, so now that the trails are there, um, I, I've heard all kinds of maybe safety issues around, like maybe even like cars driving on the trails or getting on the trails, and I, I don't understand that. Um, you know, that, that's one of them. Another thing is that when, when this program was started, we didn't have, and we didn't have the, the scooters and bicycles traveling at the rate of speed that, that they are now. Um, is there anything, is, is the, the department, are you looking at this for anything for safety-wise that we can do to these active transportation trails? Um, because things have changed a lot very quickly in the, la in the last three years. Um, is there any safety measures being put in or restrictions being? I know there's been some policy and le legislative work on classifying certain devices and so on and so forth. I think it's, I think they're mostly regs. There might be a few. Uh, but yeah, they are definitely working on it because it's been discussed a lot because it is an issue for sure now. Some of those scooters can reach speeds of 60, 70 kilometers an hour, I believe. So yeah, so there is, there are taking some steps to put them in the right places and legislate. Yeah. We'll put some legislation in place. Sure, I'll tell you what's So we're putting some legislation in place on the probably the speeds of the the scooters that they can use, but but the actual active transportation trails. The, the, is is there any talk about lining those, or is there any like how do we make those safer? That's a good point. I mean, the first step obviously is to legislate who can be on them with what and so on and so forth. So I guess that would be step one, but. It's a good suggestion. Again, you get into maintenance and having to reline them every year and so on yeah. and so forth. But yeah, for sure. Cheryl, how much rotate? And it's a conversation that, that you know I wouldn't have thought about if we just had an, if we were just thinking in terms of a normal bicycle or a normal walker. Yeah. I mean that's but we're we're going at four and five times the speed sometimes. So um, and, and can. Well, we're here. Can we can we just look at those and, and talk about a, a fining system if there's not one already um, about any 
anything that's we, we have to look at these we have to build with these trails now that they're there we have to build the policy around these trails so I just want to bring that to the to the minister um, I'll just change about active transportation um, t staying on safety um, in in my area Shelltown West Royalty we have the Capitol Drive area where it's coming in from Cornwall, you're coming up, um, you're entering into Charlottetown. Um, it's been log jammed. It's been that 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 intersection has been an absolute nightmare. Um, there's a lot of safety concerns. Um, at the best of times, um, if there wasn't repairs going on in my community, which, which sends thousands of cars there, it's like days of thunder coming through that intersection. And what we're asking people is to walk across the street right after the round point. And it's, I've seen close calls, I've seen, I've been up there with, with, with people in my community. I'm worried about that intersection. So the reason why I'm bringing it up in an under active transportation is that the Liberal Party put in a request in the capital <laughs> budget to do an underpass that would, uh, would, would allow people from various sections of that community to, to, to go safely across in that area. Was that in this capital budget? Never, never mind. I know it's not. <laughs> but, I, I, I don't. I don't think it's in there. No, and I just to save time, it's not in there. Um, but, but I wanted to bring it up and just put it on record. It's, it's because I've been lobbying for this for five, five or six years, um, and I know it's a difficult thing. But I want to ask government if we can. If we can, uh, well, wherever I was, I have lobbied for because it it's important. Um, can we look and, and the staff? Can we can we revisit this again um, in the in the future? Um, and that the minister is watching because it is a safety concern, and there's thousands of cars in that intersection, and and somebody's going to get hurt. So I just wanted to put that on record. Thank and you. The active transportation trail through my district is going to be completed now, so we will be able to travel from the Terry Fox Center all the way to that roundabout on an active transportation trail. So that's, that's <coughs> great. traffic will increase. Well, that's, and we share dis, we yeah. share uh, dish, so w once it gets there, Minister, make sure there's an underpass so we can get to the other side. Sure. Yeah. Thanks a lot for that time. Thank you, Chair. Any further questions? Shall the section carry? Sure. Yeah. Capital improvements, <coughs> buildings, appropriations provided for capital improvements and construction. Capital repairs, 18449000 Emergency preparedness government, 3500000 Total capital improvements, buildings, 21,949,000. Charlottetown Brighton. Um, so you're underspending uh, by over $4 million in capital repairs this year. Um, did um, some of the buildings uh, disappear during Fiona? So, or, or what's the reason for um, for the much lower? Yeah, the, the, the majority of the, of the, the change in the cash flow uh, Related to a project that's going on in uh, at, um, in uh, Kings County, um, there there's a Kings County maintenance depot being um, redeveloped uh, on the site. Uh, so there, uh, the speed of the building is is there's an, uh, a large portion in in the 23-24 capital budget to uh, offset some of the underspending from the previous year. Charlottetown Brighton. So are you? Are we speaking about additions to building or just changes to existing buildings? Uh, it was a little bit of a, an upgrade and, and an enhancement of, of the government garage, um, the Kings County government garage. It's the third uh, and final sort of building that uh, the department uses. Um, I think there's a, a, a new parking lot going in for mm -hmm. upwards of 60 uh, buses for the area. Um, so it's a central hub for sure. the snow plows and the gears that um, are, are in Kings County. Charlton Brighton. So I'm a big believer in fixing up uh, existing buildings. Just look at this one here. But um, what I think I've asked this question several times uh, during the last week. What are, you, what are you doing to make sure that when you do an upgrade, that whatever you do meets the net zero goals of the province? Uh, you know, that particularly comes into place if you're replacing windows, replacing roofs, uh, installing new heating equipment, stuff like that. Yeah, I, I think that's in the, the building standards that they, they are, are using now so that those enhancements are there um, when, when buildings are being planned. Charlotte on Brighton? Well, those 
building standards, or if you talk about the building code, it's like 40 years old, more or less. Uh, or are you speaking about new standards? Of some well, I was talking about uh, achieving the net zero goal. So, yeah. you know, as we're not just relying on the national building code for minimum standards. I think they're they're looking and, and reaching beyond that to uh, to uh, try to look and, and be as efficient as they can any time there's uh, structures or upgrades uh, being contemplated. Okay, well, sure, I'm breaking. That's good to hear. Uh, I'm looking at the uh, breakdown list of, uh, of capital improvements in buildings. Um, There's a biomass heat installation. Uh, I, I assume that's a wood chip burner being installed somewhere, the tail end of the installation. That's the tail end, correct. Yeah. Sure, I'm so I'm always worried about, you know, where is this biomass coming from? Is it a, is it a, whatever you call it, clear cutting and chipping or imported or, or is it sustainably produced? Uh, or is there no telling? Do you basically just buy the cheapest chips you can get? Uh, no, part is part of the, the plan when the biomass installations were mm -hmm. uh, were coming online was um, a plan to having the sustainability of, of the source of chips as well. Um, unfortunately, due to Fiona, there will be no shortage of chips available <laughs> for the next period of time. So, sure, that breaks them. Well, that is. Actually, an interesting question because, as far as I hear, most of the wood is being buried in central site, not being chipped. It could be burned. Uh, I mean, the uh, the burner down on the waterfront will take considerable pieces of wood, and burn it fine. But that's not happening. Um, uh, there's some work underway as to what the, the best and most efficient way to deal with the, the downed trees. Uh, mm -hmm. The department is looking at that. Cheryl Tom Brighton. Further down, there's building ventilation and system upgrades. Uh, that that doesn't relate to schools, I take it, but uh, other well, the, buildings. No, this is an access site in, uh, in O'Leary. Cheryl Tom Brighton. And a substantial amount for the Georgetown Church Preservation. Uh, is that one you see right next to the King's Playhouse? Uh, I believe so, yes. Charlton Brighton. So what's the scheduled use of that? Uh, last time I heard about it, it was in, the, in private hands. What, what happened to it? Uh, we were lucky enough to get it through a tax sale and default. Um, so the province owns it now. Yeah. Um, so they're up. Restoring the, the structure. Charlton Brighton. Well, that's good to hear. Um, so there's a new county highway depot uh, budgeted in here. Where's uh, where will that be located? That's Central Queens or Central uh, Bridgetown. Sorry, it's the Bridgetown Depot. Oh, yeah. Charlton Brighton. So you're building a big new building. That's already an existing facility there. Well, there was an existing facility so, there. I think there was, it was a, an add-on, an enhancement to it. Okay. Um, Charlton Brighton. And um, Community Health Centre in Alperton. I'm sure there will be other MLAs here that would like to hear what that's about. Is that uh, one of yeah. their famous homes? Or? <laughs> Yeah, it's um, yeah, it's the one um, that um, transportation is taking on for uh, for uh, health PEI. Uh, it was a combo on the site for um, some housing, a housing project and a health center on the same site. So uh, they thought it would best uh, sit in this particular uh, space and, and and be a building owned by uh, by by the DTI at the end of the day and government in general. And Charles on Brighton. So, uh, so is that one of the homes being there, or is it just a more ordinary clinic or whatever? It, they're they're called the West Prince Community Health Center. So, Charles oh. Brighton. I'll leave the questions there for the uh, for the other MLAs. Um, so, Province House uh, that jumped out too. Uh, I, I know the feds are spending a lot of money there. What what are we spending money on? Um, <laughs> from our perspective, it's uh, more on the enhancements to the building. I think there's some security 
um, upgrades that are going to be required uh, over there and some of the kind of the up uh, the re retrofit for what what government's intention or the or for the legislative assembly to to work efficiently Charlton Brighton so when we get to moving in which probably won't be in my lifetime that sounds a, a lot of money that's more than just a a, f a fit up but what uh, what's included in that yeah, for, for a number of years, um, there's been, um, if you've ever been through the Sullivan Building, there's many interior staircases, but not, there's no exterior staircase that you can get right to the outside. Or that um, meets the code. It, it, uh, that's right, yeah. so it, okay. it's a code yeah. requirement. Yeah. Sure, I'm right. uh, Thank you, I'm good, good for now. I'll let somebody sure. else ask questions. Yeah. Sure, I'm Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. Um, following on you know, from the handout that you provided, you're talking about the green, greening and retrofit program. Uh, which is 10 million over five years, starting 2.5 million annually, but not until 24-25. Is that correct? Is, there's no, is there no investment with that program in the next fiscal year? Uh, no, there's three and a half million three in 23-24. Okay. Sure, Tom Belvedere. Thank you. And this is a fund that's going to be used for government buildings and including schools. Is that correct? Um, not necessarily the schools. This first run would be at, uh, at, at government, other government infrastructure. Um, I think the, the point was made that it's not just good enough to start with your new builds. You have to be looking at your current infrastructure as well. So this, uh, this new sort of fund is, is starting that, that process. Charlotte Belvedere. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. It's a critical piece because, you know, infrastructure, such as buildings, are our key contributor and the older buildings are worse. <laughs> so, yeah, we have, that's where the bulk of our, our assets sit. We're not going to be replacing all those buildings, so we're going to have to retrofit, which is really expensive. Um, so is there, is there kind of some an assessment or, or um, initial kind of project that kind of looks at, because I'm honestly looking at that thinking that's actually not a lot of money considering how many buildings we have and how old they are. Um, so I guess there's two parts to that question. Is, is part of this within the capital budget going to be an assessment or a kind of prioritization exercise? And then do you expect that to then come back perhaps with a revision on, on the, the forecast? Yeah, no, I, I'm just kind of checking my notes here, and I might have misspoke. The, the three and a half million is actually for the next item that's in the budget. So oh, okay. Indeed, the, the note that's in your handout is correct. It doesn't so start. So it's not going to start for another year. And um, the information I have... Um, <laughs> I think it's the same note that, that you have, is that there's, there needs to be some policy development developed between um, in, uh, energy, environment, climate action, and transportation and infrastructure. So once they kind of get the policy work as to where and what they will be doing, um, I suspect you're right that is two and a half, it's a place marker right yeah. now for sure, and as the projects are identified, the cash flow will come and match the projects that are going to be undertaken. Sure, Tom Belvedere. Yeah, and so that year gap would be that planning piece, which will happen in an operational perspective, and then we can hope to start to see some. Yeah, that that makes that makes sense. I mean, that there's, they like said they, I think it's one of the things you start digging and lifting up the roof tiles. It's going to be probably a bit of a shocking, <laughs> shocking experience for everybody. Um, so the the other piece around that, um, along with the greening piece, which sounds like said like a placeholder, is around the emergency preparedness piece. Um, which again, I, like I know from the handout, that's primarily about generators for key infrastructure sites. But my concern with that is again, it's not starting until like another year or so out, and I don't know if we can wait that long to have generators at key infrastructure sites. Is there any kind of interim expenditure that could be made, or or something in the event that we have another event that requires generators? Um, yeah, there's. Any time there is an emergency, there's an opportunity. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so I, I would say that it, if it comes, uh, uh, the biggest issue for these uh, items is the, the actual size of the units that are required. Yeah. So they're not just, you know, go to a local um, hardware store and pick them off the shelf. They're, you, know, you have to order them, lead yeah. time them. Um, you have to have them match to the specifics for the building to get the right size in there. So I think that was more... Um, the thought process behind kind of starting it in 23, 24, is to try to match some of those specifics and then have, have the plan ready to go and start uh, looking at some of the projects. Cheryl, I'm Belvedere. 
Thank you. And that, and that really makes sense because you're right. Like these aren't like two for one at Canadian Tire. These are kind of the, the industrial industrial size that have to be, and they also have to be professionally installed and, and maintained and so on. Um, you know, the, the the selection of the spaces that are identified is also really important. Obviously, we've also had discussions in here around um, the, the, some of the real risk areas around um, like energy sources, like the the gas pumping station at um, or at, at the Irving thing. Um, and I, and I don't see those kind of sites in here. These are more kind of provision of services sites. Are those, would those be handled under a different department? Um, no, that, that's kind of a tricky area because that's yeah. a privately held location, even though it may be key infrastructure. Right. So I suspect, um, and I'm not at this table by any stretch of the imagination, but that would be some of the outcomes of the post-Fiona work as to how we work with um, the third party and the private sector to um, ensure that uh, those services are up and running. I think some of the examples that you're looking at here would be in your larger schools that could serve as warming centers and things yep. like that um, in, in the event of uh, a prolonged outage. Um, but uh, again, there is, um, you know, another, you know, it's kind of two parts of the program. There's five million for generators and it talks about two and a half million for what comes out of the post Fiona debrief. So if there is capital infrastructure that needs to be procured and set and with a lease arrangement I, I think there's funding there for that. Okay. Sure, Belvedere. Thank you and I'm hoping that, that some of that, that kind of flex in the resiliency fund also addresses the fact that there's no sites here that are actually in Charlottetown. Um, these these are you know and I do appreciate that, you know the, the, the caveat on there around some of these are not necessarily being identified because they're schools but because they could be alternative sites but one of the real challenges during Fiona was the absence of a central point that was accessible for Charlottetown residents and while I recognize there is like a, a municipal factor um, that kind of overall emergency preparedness sits under the provincial file and so you know, I'm, I'm trying to double check that I'm not speaking out of turn but I don't see anything I don't know where the Leah Crane building is but I don't recognize it. So, you know, I, I would hope that there would be some flexibility. I recognize that um, QEH has its own, already has the generator yep. system, but, but if we're looking at this in terms of some of that flexible approach, the absence of anything in Charlottetown is a real, is a real gap. So I would just ask, Minister, um, that you would consider that in terms of the, the resiliency response, because it was a real problem for us during, during Fiona. Um, and I think it's something, if there's a lesson to be learned, it's, it's um, the need for that more coordinated response for all residents, including those who live in the capital city. Um, and and, yep, no, and we're, uh, we're that would be my ask. We're working <laughs> with the great city of Charlottetown all the time. So, yep. you know, in the EMO kind of world, you know, it's their first responsibility to look after the residents of Charlottetown. And if they have some struggles to come to the province, it's the way the EMO yep. kind of model is established. And, and I think, you know, overall coordination has to be there. And, I would note that the Shaw Sullivan is would be the, some of the PAB down there. It is yeah. in Geraldtown. Uh, the provincial um, correction center at Sleepy Hollow is awfully close to Charlottetown. Yeah. Not quite in Charlottetown, but yeah. there is some examples. And just you're right, there's not any school examples on yeah. there. Yeah, and that could be one of the opportunities. Would yep. be, you know, a central Charlottetown school could be a really great fit for something like that. So, um, again, it's just, a, it's just an observation, and, and I think there's flexibility there in that. So, it, um, it's really positive to see that kind of um, approach coming in at, in terms of lesson learned even before you've done the debrief. So, um, it, that's good to see. I'm good with that, Chair. Thank you. Hola, Ian Verness. Uh, just to give a little more detail on the access uh, PEI ventilation and system upgrades. And I, I'm kind of bringing this question up a bit because I know that the government side, when they were in opposition, used to throw these questions back at me. And the, and the issue is, is that the access center in O'Leary comprises of two buildings. It has one building that has a heating system in, which is now vacant and empty. And that's what the criticism was, how are you heating buildings that there's nobody in, but it provides the heat for the other side of the building. So I'm just sort of wondering, in these ventilation and system upgrades, for because heating, geothermal heating is going to be involved, are both buildings going to be uh, upgraded and renovated and uh, provided heat? And hence, what is the plans for the building that's currently sitting vacant? The short answer is I don't, I'm not sure <laughs> what, the, what the plan is for for the building beside the building. It's, I think it was a former vet clinic or something. That, that's correct. It um, was. Are you in Vanessa? Yeah, it's... I'm um, oh, sorry. I think, I think I've asked that question. I just don't remember what the outcome was, but 
I'll try to find out whether or not with this particular project, whether I, I know there's some concern about just walking away from the other building as well. Um, well, are we in Vanessa? Yeah, and I, I guess that's right. You know, I, I would hope that both buildings are going, because they're side by side and there's a parking lot in between. And uh, as it continues to deteriorate, it's sort of a bit of a, I'll say, a blight on our access centre. And, uh, you know, I know the big issue that I keep getting thrown back at me when I come up with ideas on how to, uh, what to utilize that building for, is that there was some asbestos that was involved in the tiles, the ceiling tiles, I think maybe even in the flooring, I'm not totally certain of that, but, so that's always the bigger cost of mitigation. I'm wondering if that will be included in this, you know, at least if that was removed, <laughs> then we could start all over again and, and I could move forward instead of this backwards. Yeah, I think the last time the question came up, there was nothing on the books for Access O'Leary, so I think we're <laughs> one step further. <laughs> but again, I, I didn't follow up with enough uh, information as to what the, the fate of the other building is. And I'll, I'll try to find that out. O'Leary and Burnett. Well, and I am, and I want to commend the Minister and, and the Minister of Public Works on that, that at least this is a movement at 1.2 million. It's a reasonable amount of money. Uh, and uh, I just you know, I'll say thanks for that movement, but I would really hope that we continue to make both of them up to at least a standard that we can make use of them and, uh, uh, or at least decide what the future is going to be if the building that doesn't seem to be getting a lot of use. Uh, uh, and I, I guess I should emphasize it is being used. It's used for storage at the moment. There's, I think, just uh, some sporting equipment and things of that nature that's in there, but uh, it's probably not that's that's pretty expensive storage, I guess, is where I'm coming from. So, anyway, so thanks, Chair. I just wanted to make that statement. Charlotte, have Victoria Power. Thank you, Chair. And I just, I, don't, I just have a couple of questions here. Um, under the the emergency preparedness, it does. What exactly does that include? Is that that's not just generators? You may have announced. I was trying to listen to see if I caught that, but I didn't really hear that. Um, the, the first the first part of it for sure would be uh, uh, a fund to, um, as, as, as the notes and the handouts in, 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 in um, upgrade and enhance some of the generating capacity a uh, number of government uh, buildings that, um, that require power for extended outages. Um, so that would be about five million and the second tranche of it would be two and a half million um, to, to work on projects that come out of whatever report comes out of the FIONA uh, debrief and that um, if there are some capital expenditures required as a result of uh, um, the, the lessons learned or the future things to be concerned about uh, in future events, then uh, there'll be some funding available for that. Charlotte and Victoria Burke. Thank you, Chair. So if I'm hearing you correctly, Gord, sorry, I'm, I'm having a little bit of trouble hearing. So there's a little bit of wiggle room in there for lessons learned. Is that... A absolutely. Like, um, I think when we, when the, the minister was, was preparing the budget, um, you know, hot on the heels of, of the issue with, with Fiona, if there was, you know, no mention or no funding in here for what could come, um, I think that was, was a gap. And um, so, although we don't have a specific plan, I think there's some, some funding there that uh, could be available for uh, projects that are identified. Charlotte Victoria Park. That's that's really important. Thank you for that. Um, so I'm wondering, does this total include generators for public housing? Uh, no, the social development housing budget would have had additional money added to their um, to their repairs and maintenance um, and upgrades uh, section mm -hmm. to to start working on uh, uh, generators for those buildings. Charlotte okay. Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. And I think this is my last question. The, um, the generators that were given to the fire halls, what, is that in this budget? Or is uh, that in a different one? No, that, would, that was more of a grant to, um, to the fire service. So the, the, the generators were procured on their behalf and, uh, and distributed mm -hmm. uh, to the various uh, departments. Charlotte and Victoria Park. Sorry, they, I missed what you said. They were procured they, by or they for? They were procured by government um, oh. and then and then given. So it's a grant. It's sort of granted to uh, fire departments. Charlotte and Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. I will save the rest of my questions for question period on that. Thank you very much. Charlotte and Brighton. Um, well, I, I like the fact that there's a substantial money in there for 
emergency generators. Uh, one jumped out like a generator for the Borden scale house. That seems like that wouldn't be the top priority any more than the hut down in our parking lot uh, for emergency. Um, well, the, the goods have to keep moving um, on and off the, the island, and you know the trucking goods across the bridge is, is an important uh, connection for supply chain. So, if the scale house is down, then you know we're, there's at risk of you know overweight uh, trucks and, and no inspection going on out there. So, it is an, a vital part of the infrastructure uh, network. Charlottetown, sure, Brighton. So. Uh I'm wondering about that. That's a good, uh, good answer. Thank you. Uh, I'm wondering about how the buildings are picked, like the Shaw Sullivan building, for instance, uh, compared to say an access office, wherever it is. Uh, access offices is kind of the first place for communication between uh, government and uh, islanders. So that makes sense. Uh, but government buildings in general, as, as well as schools, typically close if we have an emergency, nobody goes home. Uh, what's the point of having an emergency generator in, the, say, the Shaw Sullivan building? Well, the, the, the Shaw and the Sullivan building in particular is one of the hubs for the uh, infra with the uh, network uh, servers and, and the network infrastructure. Okay. So um, yeah. it's important that that stays up and running. There's oh, two, yeah. two sites, one at here at the Sullivan and one at the QEH, yeah. and um, they both have to be up and running. No, uh, Charlotte and Brighton? I completely agree. Um, so my other question, you have a, let's see if I can find it. There was a school in here too. Yeah, New Stratford School. Um, having an emergency generator there means, does that mean that you will be operating it as a warming center, a place where you can get food and showers and stuff like that? I, I, I would suspect that's part of the plan when they're looking at the larger buildings, um, and that's why Three Oaks is mentioned there in uh, the New Stratford School. Um, there, they have the largest gymnasiums, they have the largest footprint to house the majority of the people. They usually have a you know, kitchen facilities there as well, so they're well equipped to uh, to respond in in in, in, a, in an emergency. Okay, sure. I'm Brighton. I'm good, thanks. Show sure. Larry Inverness. I was thinking back to those generators that were purchased for the fire departments. Uh, how many generators were purchased? Like every fire department got a few generators. Um, definitely through the operating budget, but I think they were 15 per department. Oh, Larry Inverness. So 15 generators for department, and you said that the uh, the province procured those generators. So what kind of numbers are we talking, and how much money was spent on 15 generators per department? Be a lot. I th yeah, I think there was an announcement on it. I think there was yeah. 720,000, I think. Oh, Larry Inverness. Uh, so I I've been looking for the uh, tender documents on that. Were that was that tendered? Uh, I'm, I'm unaware of the procurement method that they used for that. Oh, Larry and Vanessa? I was told they weren't. So I'm just wondering how that happened. <laughs> because it, I had a couple of companies that said they were looking for the tenders on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm not aware of them. Oh, Larry and Vanessa? I just, I guess, I would, if he does, doesn't know, I mean, I'm not expecting to answer uh, something that he doesn't know, but maybe, uh, uh, I'm assuming procurement maybe falls under the minister, does it not? Yeah. <laughs> would you know? Don't, but I, I'm pretty sure that they, I guess availability was the big issue, I think, wherever they could get them, so to speak, but I'm not 100% I'm not sure either. Huh? Well, Larry and Uh Yeah, I, anyway, I, I just happened to have a couple of companies that were looking for the tenders on it, and they could have gotten them, and uh, they felt uh, they didn't weren't aware of where the tender, and they were asking me, and I said, I've never seen it either, so I was a little bit surprised that uh, a number of generators showed up at a few uh, fire departments, uh, then the fire departments really weren't even aware of what was coming. So anyway, just uh, make that statement, uh, Chair. Okay. Shall the section carry? Carry, carry. Total capital expenditure, transportation and infrastructure, 80264000 Shall it carry? Carry. Shall the budget carry? Carry. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Ed. Thank you, my mom. <laughs> Finish one. Okay. Chair, I move that the speaker take the chair and that the chair make report to Mr. Speaker. Shall I carry? Go back. Mr. Speaker, as chair of the Committee of the Whole House, I wish to report that the committee has gone into capital supply to be granted to His Majesty and has come to certain resolutions thereon, which said resolutions I am directed to report to the House whenever it should be pleased to receive same. The Honourable Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker. I move, seconded by the Minister of Transportation <coughs> and Infrastructure, that the report of the committee be received. Mr. Carey. Mr. Speaker, I move that the report of the committee be adopted. Should it? Carey. 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 Ready? Ready? The Honorable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. I move seconded by the Minister of Finance that the 30th order of the day be now read. Show the carry. Order number 30, Residential Tenancy Act, Bill number 187, ordered for second reading. The Honorable Minister of Transportation Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Honorable Minister of Finance that the said bill be now read a second time. Show the carry. Carry. Bill number 87, Residential Tenancy Act, read a second time. The Honorable Minister of Transportation Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, I move, seconded by the Minister of Finance, that this House do now resolve itself into a committee of the whole House to take into consideration the said bill. Shall it carry? <laughs> Honorable Minister of Charlottetown Winslow. <laughs> Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, please. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, the House is now in a committee of the whole House to take into consideration a bill to be in titual, Bill Number 87, uh, the Residential Tenancy Act. Um, there has been a request to bring a stranger on the floor. Shall it be granted? Interesting. Good afternoon, stranger. Would you uh, mind uh, introducing yourself and your title for Hanser, please? Not at all. I'm uh, Vernon McIntyre, and I'm the Legislative Coordinator for Social Development and Housing. Thank you, Vernon, and welcome. Uh, Minister, uh, before we uh, begin debate, would you, uh, do you have a statement on the bill's intent, or? Sure, so thank you, Chair. Um, first off, I guess I would like to, uh, uh, to say thanks to everybody that's worked on the RTA over the last few years. Uh, this was uh, a piece of legislation that started under the previous administration. Um, it went through a couple ministers of social development and housing. Uh, the latest minister, uh, or MLA for Rustico Emerald, um, put an extremely amount of effort into this, so I'd like to thank him. Also, I'd like to thank uh, the official opposition and the third party for their info. And most importantly, I'd like to thank the, the tenants and landlords that uh, not only provided information and input, but uh, they provide a great deal of patience as well to, to get this to where it is. So uh, uh, thanks, Chair, and thanks everybody involved. Thank you, uh, Minister. Uh, so first, I'd want to check with the uh, committee if we would like to go section by section, clause by clause, or just open it up to general questions. I would say section by section. Section by section? Okay, thank you. So we will start on section one, definitions. Are there any questions on definitions? Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, the, the definition for court has changed from, oh, actually, can, let me re, restart this. Sorry. This is too big to just jump into questions. I really want to say thank you for bringing this forward. Um, it's been a long time in the making. There's, I know there's been a lot of hands on deck doing this. Um, I know our caucus had submitted several amendments um, and some of which, thank you, some of which have been um, incorporated and, and we'll, we'll talk about some of that today. Um, and so I just want to thank you for being here with us today. Um, so the, the definition of court has changed from the, um, the previous draft and I'm wondering if you can explain that. Um, so as we work through these uh, different um, definitions, we often get input from our legal counsel as well as the legislative council office. So a change, I, I, you know, I, I'm not a lawyer, just to be very clear. So, but that would, that change would have come through from legislative council office to say this is a more appropriate definition. Okay. Charles and Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. And um, I, I kind of, I realized <coughs> I kind of skipped past something that I wanted to, in, in the very beginning, you've added in um, the uh, housing as a human right bit. And I, I want to thank you for that. I think that that's really important because it sets the context mm -hmm. for how this should be interpreted. But I'm wondering, um, is was there ever any consideration for stronger language? I know that in some other um, pieces of legislation, you've got a very clear statement of how this is to be interpreted. So um, to see some stronger language so that there's not any doubt that if, if there are um, um, anything that if we need to refer back to this piece of legislation that it's very clear that the default is that housing is a human right and so I'm wondering if you could speak to that a little bit well so yeah it, it, the answer is yes everything's considered um, when again when I, we speak to our legal counsel and they provide legal advice um, the the thought process for here was Canada has signed this um, I keep wanting to say convention but it's a covenant um, and that is the statement of fact. And then from there, the language around, you know, directing that this, these rights are an important part of um, the rights of tenants and landlords and the obligation, you know, the, the agreement is an important part to go back to our country and our province meeting those sort of obligations or the recognizing obligations around, um, around, uh, Meeting Canada meeting its I'm sorry Canada meeting its obligation to uh, for the covenant. So, but that's yeah. Charlotte Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. So that 
then is the default if there's ever let's say I know I, I'm getting ahead of myself here but as an example um, one of the things that we had pushed forward was to ensure that um, tenants could live free of discrimination and harassment and and the department told us that that was already covered under quiet enjoyment so in a case of something like that the default is you go back to housing as a human right and and look at what that entails is that the default um. That's that's a I'd almost I'd need to talk to legal on that to see what that what the answer would be to that one. Where where I would say it is, you know, the act is very clear we have an agreement between a tenant and a landlord. And that would be what the director would be looking at in terms of their decisions is has the agreement been deviated. It really comes back to um, the the idea that this act is about an agreement between a tenant and a landlord. Um, whether the landlord is the province or a private landlord. Um, so that's where the, the director, you know, again, would look at common law, they would look at contract law, those types of things. That would be the director of, well, in this case, what now we call residential tenancy. Charlotte and Victoria Park. Okay, thank you, Chair. So I guess, <clears throat> yeah, if you could bring that back, that would be great because um, I know there's all kinds of things to consider in something like this, but I think it's really important that what this section does is set out this as a default that in any dispute, in any confusion, it's housing as a human right that we return to. So I would really appreciate that. For sure. um, so only the Supreme Court was referenced in the Rental of Residential Property Act. So what would the role of the provincial court be under this legislation? Again, so it's, 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 it gets fairly complex when you get into the court, but the process, you know, so we have, an, we have an agreement between landlord and tenant. There's been some dispute. So that would go first to the director as an application for them to review the dispute and make a decision. Then there would be an appeal. And so that would be held by IRAC if, if the tenant or the landlord disagree with the director's decision. And then from there, it would go to court. The idea, again, for this um, big, big picture is that the director's office should be able to handle many of the different disagreements uh, between tenants and landlords that you wouldn't have to go to court. So that's the, that's the main goal is, you know, so the tenants and landlords don't have to hire lawyers, don't have to go through a complete legal process. If we didn't have this system, any time there was a dispute, you'd have to go to court over it, as, as with any other broken contract. Um, so the idea is to keep this... Yeah. Sorry, I was just going to interrupt you there, but continue on. But when you do answer your question, if you can answer uh, more, more through the uh, microphone oh, so they I'm can sorry. pick up your response, that'd be great. Sorry, okay, but did sure. you have something to continue with, Vernon? Nope. Or no? nope, that's great. Okay, perfect. Uh, Charlotte and Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. Could you give me an example of, of a dispute that would go to court under this legislation? Well, it wouldn't happen very often. Um, but one that could would be, say, a tenant left owing rent and a landlord applied to the director and um, the director said, no, I disagree. The tenant doesn't owe rent. So then the landlord applies, appeals to IRAC and IRAC says, no, we disagree. So then the landlord could at that point if they felt. Now, honestly, this is why it doesn't happen very often because if you've gone through the director's office and you've gone through the appeal process and both times you've been told, this is probably not appropriate. We don't believe this tenant owes you in this case, but you could still go to court. But again, I, you know, you'd spend more money probably than it's worth. And at the end of the day, we've got a number of very smart minds, both in the director's office and at IRAC in terms of the appeals board, who would be telling you, no, we don't, we don't agree with you on the context of this act. So, but that would be an example. Charlottetown Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. So, um, uh, so are, whenever you're talking, would this would these be like civil cases? Yes, I believe so. Um, and again, I'm not just to be very clear. I'm not a lawyer, and I'm not an expert in the court process, but. From my discussions with the director's office right now, sort of in the lead up to creating this act or working on this act, it, it's very, very rare that something would go to court. Um, but I, my understanding is that, yeah, it would be a civil court, because as with any other broken contract. Charlotte Hill, Victoria Park. Okay. Oh my goodness, I've lost my place. I can put you back on the list. 
Yeah. Perfect. Sure. Thank you. Thank Summerside you. Wilmot. Chair, and I would like to also add my voice in thank you for bringing this forward. I know it's been a long time coming, and I've had a huge amount of people in my district who have been impacted directly while we've been waiting for this. So I'm really grateful it's on the floor today, and I thank you both for being here. I guess I had similar questions to my colleague from uh, Charlottetown, Victoria Park, on the change in court applications here. So. Previously, it only went through the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court was the only court that was mentioned, and now the provincial courts are mentioned. Um, Charlottetown Victoria Park was asking what new involvement the provincial courts have, what you're describing, the civil case where if I disagree with the director and then I disagree with IRAC, I could certainly sue. I don't think there was anything in the old act that would have precluded me from being able to sue. So I, I don't see a new involvement from the example that you have described that involves the courts, but I'm obviously missing something. I'm no, I think no, I think you're 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 perfectly correct. I, I mean again, a lot of what's in this act is better defining and putting modern language to what were the common law processes that maybe weren't described. I mean if you look at this act versus the old, it's sixty pages versus twenty, but a lot of what was in the old act was sort of unspoken. It was common law, it was so you didn't you know it wasn't put in there. Now we've taken some greater clarity and put them in. Um, but no, I think you're absolutely correct. Like, I don't think there's, a, there's an intention to change the court process in this, in this act. Summerside Wilma. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I appreciate that. I was actually really curious if we were seeing a major impact on the courts under the old legislation. I, I wouldn't think there would be a major amount. No, as uh, I said, it would be very rare for something to go to court. Summerside Wilma. Thank you, Chair. But and I don't even have a solid example of one. Like it's it's when I discussed this with the director's office, it was it would be very, very rare. Summerside Wilma. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I would certainly think so. I would believe that going through the process that's laid out now, where you first start with the director and then you can appeal to IRAC. So I was surprised when I saw an expanded role for the courts. Well the courts would always have so there's always that that process um, legally. You always have the ability to work through, and it, so there always was that ability. Yeah, it's not changed exactly. that I that I'm aware of. Um, and again, I'm I'm the legal drafter. We give the instructions, but you know when they get into the courts, I'm taking my legal advice on. You know, we should have this change to this definition. We it should be more clear in this piece of the act. But no, I don't think that there's. It's very rare that something would go to court. And again, to instigate a court process, my understanding is it's fairly expensive for a civil court process. It is. And typically you wouldn't get to that kind of funding, you know, the, like the amounts involved to bring justify. court process in wouldn't justify what you were going to get as a return. Summerside Wilma. Thank you, Chair. I, I entirely agree on that. Although I was delighted to hear that the Minister of Justice intends to address all just access to justice issues moving forward. I'll look forward to that. But in the short term, it certainly doesn't make a lot of sense to end up before the courts in most cases. So the other change in definition that I was curious about is on mobile home sites. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a new definition from the old legislation. This is something that's come up for me in my district. I have a number of mobile home sites in my district, mm -hmm. and issues pertaining to that has come up quite a lot, so it caught my eye. I was just wondering why we have a new definition here? What was the purpose of this sort of expanded definition? Yeah, so it, it, it has come up, I, I realize your writing is one of the writings that have, have yeah. a number of mobile home sites. So it's just again for greater clarity, um, because I'd, I'd have to get the old act out and I don't have the definitions memorized. Um, I can look at it though, I have it here. But in the, in the old act, it wasn't, I think there was some confusion and I don't, not at the, not at the IRAC level, not at the director's level, but maybe in the public, that people use the term mobile park site, mobile park, sort of, in the public, they used them sort of interchangeably, and they're not. So it's just to expand the definition. Summerside Wilma. Thank you, Chair. I'm just comprehending that here. So mobile home park and mobile home site, we, I see what you're saying. Yeah, so in, in, the majority of cases with mobile homes in a park, you're renting the site. So there's a park, yeah, yep, yep, and then yep. you're renting a site. And we just wanted to make that clear in the act that you know there is a difference. And again, so people aren't using those terms interchangeably because they're very different. You know, the landlord has uh, you know an obligation to keep the park, the roads clean, the, those types of things. That's the park, and then the site is what the tenant is renting. 
Summerside Wilmot, I'll yeah. go two more questions and then uh, I can put you back on the list. Do you know right? what? My next question is quite different from this, so feel free to put me on the bottom of your list now okay. and I'll come back. Perfect, thank you. Charlotte Helm Ryden? Uh, this is just a general question and I'm really, really pleased with the uh, Tennessee Act as you've brought it forward. I've just noticed all the acts coming in here usually have a minister attached and mentioned in it, as well as regulations. Uh, could you talk a little bit about why you, why this act doesn't have that? And uh, regulations, for instance, would be, I assume, very useful to kind of tweak the things, little, little mistakes that might or might not be in the uh, in the act. So. This is, a, you know, and the majority of acts that I'm used to working with. So, for instance, the Social Assistance Act, you're correct. There's a minister responsible, and it's in the act. This act is relating to tenancy agreements and dispute process run by the director's office and then the appeals for IRAC. So there isn't a minister directly involved. It's, it's really IRAC is the body that does that, you know, that IRAC is the body, so there's not a minister the director works for IRAC. Um, IRAC hears the appeals. So putting a minister responsible is not really the way you would go in this one. It's really IRAC is the body that's responsible, and they're at arm's length from government. Charles Hill Brighton? Well, the only thing is that IRAC, uh, just like judges, can go in and tweak the act if, it, if there are little irregularities or things, undesirable things. So that means that the only way you can do that would be through an amendment like the minister did with a, with a cap on the rent increase. Uh, so, so that's a deliberate. You want to keep that distance. You want to make it difficult. Yeah. Well, and, and again, I, I don't know what you. I'm not sure I, I understand when you're saying Iraq can tweak an act. No one can tweak an act unless it's a minister. No, no, I said oh, can't. Can't. Okay, yeah, sorry, yeah, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't. Yeah. I didn't hear. Yeah. Okay. No. Yeah. So there is that distance, though. Yeah. The minister is not. Uh, uh, Minister McKay is not the minister responsible for Iraq. And he doesn't want to um, be. Charlotte Humbright, right? sorry. And, and he doesn't want to be, I'd say it. Yeah. Okay. Well, so thank you. You're good. Thank you. Uh, Charlotte Humbright, wants royalty? Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, thanks for this, um, Are you, uh, th this has been maybe a stop and start process for a very long time. Are you, are you confident? that there was enough consultation and that was jointed enough throughout the whole thing that all the voices were heard that you needed to hear, Mr. Absolutely, but I can uh, let her know just exactly because a lot of the consultation happened prior to me being in there, but uh, yeah, definitely go ahead. Sure. Um, so the consultation uh, was extensive. Um, there were public consultations held by education before, because this act really started with education and moved to our department in May last year, I guess, so a year and a half ago. Um, but before that education had done some, the COVID outbreak stopped that process. But after that, when we came back to us, we had another set of public consultations last year. Um, I did two virtual sessions that were very well attended, and a number of you folks were at them. Um, and we also had over 250 written submissions mm -hmm. and numbers of calls. We also worked, we also met with different groups stakeholders such as the fight for affordable housing and the landlords association so and we've met with them multiple times as well so yeah i'm, I'm pretty confident we've got a good consultation with the public on this act okay. um, I, I will remind members that we are on the definitions of section one of 117 sections so if the questions are specific to the definitions that would be great um charles how much royalty I'm, I'm on I'm on the first line of the act actually so um, so uh, recognizing um, housing is a human right did you consult with uh, human rights on that definition did you talk to them about what they would like to see in this act so again the human rights is the human rights act um, so no we didn't consult with the human rights commission on that um, what we did again is this this is very clear that the government of Canada has signed on to this covenant and that provides certain uh, obligations on government such as you know to implement a reasonable policy around housing so that people are moving towards the you know towards housing for all um, but no we didn't it's it's not the you know we haven't talked to Human Rights Act they have their act there and and their act is fairly clear on what the human rights are for tenants 
So thank you, uh, West Royalty. And I do want to make something clear. Um, so it was brought to my attention uh, as I was chairing. Um, when you're looking at the bill number 87, the Residential Tenancy Act, uh, the clauses and the enacting clause is actually uh, debated at the very end after we go through all of the sections. But if it's all right with the committee, I'll allow for general questions on the uh, opening part of the act, if that's all right with the committee, to continue with your line of questioning. Perfect. Okay, no issues. Continue on. Charlton West Royalty. So if the Human Rights Commission wasn't consulted, how does this act protect tenants' human rights? Well, again, so did you? No. Nope. So again, when, you, when we look at what the housing as a human right, so again, government has obligations. One of those obligations would be to have an act in place that outlines the appeal process, that outlines the different responsibilities, the obligations of both the tenant and the landlord. So government is moving towards meeting one of their obligations by ensuring, and we already had it before, but by ensuring that there's an act in place that has outlines the rights of both tenants and landlords and the obligations. So that's, that's how this meets housing as a human right. Charlottetown West Royalty. Take out housing as a human right. We're talking about the Tenancy Act. Take out housing. But in this act, I mean, we, we don't look at human, human rights. We don't have anything to protect human rights. Do you think that was? Yeah. Yeah. So again, so folks who know me and have been in meetings with me, and, and a lot of you have, know that I often say we already have an act in place for human rights, and you don't put that into a second act. So that's why you intentionally don't put things that would be a human right into the Tenancy Act. You have a Human Rights Act that speaks to that. Um, so that's, that's where that would go. I mean, it's, it, there's, there's all sorts of examples, but you try and keep the act separate. Charlotte Hamas Royalty. But when you, in your consulting um, with marginalized communities, if, did you consult with marginalized communities? Yes, did we they did. want, no. and what, what were their recommendations about? This line of topic. Well, so there were there were some general discussions from from different um, tenant groups, uh, fight for affordable housing, for example, wanting to have something put in around human rights. But again, it's it's really the legal advice is that that's really not appropriate to have something that's already covered in the Human Rights Act covered in a second act. Charlotte West Royalty. It 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 doesn't really. I I, I mean I. I I disagree because, and that's what I've heard and I've been talking about, and, and you know, and I'll I'll bring that argument forward, and, and I appreciate your your answers there. But when you consulted with BIPOC Usher Black Culture Society, um, you know, the the Native Council of Prince Edward Island, those groups, what were they saying about that specific topic? So what what their request was, and I'll, I'll paraphrase it. I don't have it memorized, but their request was to have something in uh, one of the further on uh, sections that actually said if a person is discriminated against, they can appeal or apply to the director. And that is where that gets a little offside because if you feel you've been discriminated against, that's where the Human Rights Act should come in. But if, and, and one of the members or mentioned it earlier, we've, we've been clear that if you are being discriminated against, so if it, if it happens at the start of the agreement, you feel that you weren't rented an apartment because of discrimination, that's human rights. If somebody is discriminating against you, they're, they're moving towards just uh, harassment, and harassment is covered in this act. And it is something the director can move for, but it would be treated as harassment, not as a human rights complaint. Charlotte and West Royals, and two more questions that I can put you back on. The That's list. A good it's a good debate, and I, 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 agree. Will, I, I agree. And I think it's important that we have that debate because what I'm hearing is that um, I, we, we didn't we didn't do enough to, to put it in there. So um, uh, we'll, I'll just leave that for. Um, so uh, the the uh, on the, the the third clause, the transparent and, and expeditious manner. On the third one, how is this act going to uh, be more transparent and expeditious? Well, so again, the transparent side is that we've taken an act that had a lot of things that were assumed under common law, and we've put them in the act now, so they're very clear. So that's where it becomes more transparent. Okay. Charlotte and West Royalty, one more question. Oh, that, that's it West. for me for now, Pastor Floor. Okay, thank you. Uh, leader of the third party. Thank you. And uh, somebody was busy. There's a lot of work went into this, for sure. Um, just, I'll start off with the definitions. Has there always been a director? Yes. Um, 
Going back to the previous act. So, so going back to the 90s, yes. So there was a direct... Uh, leader of the third party? So can you kind of differentiate the difference between a director's role and an IRAC role? I'm reading it here, but can you give yep. us the reader's digest? Yep. Uh, can you give us a brief explanation of that? Sure. So it's similar to what I had said. So, so there's a director's office. The director is in charge of that office, and, and currently Jennifer Perry is the director. She has a number of staff under her that hear applications. So again, if a tenant, we'll just use a very common one. A tenant's not paying rent. There's been an application for eviction, and the tenant says, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to fight that, uh, that, uh, my eviction notice. So first you apply to the director's office and say, I'd like to have this notice of eviction overturned. And the director's staff, or the director herself, hears the case, makes a decision, and then from there, if that decision, if either the tenant or the landlord don't agree with that decision, it would then go to an appeal heard by IRAC. But the director's office does and the rector's office does a lot of a lot of education and information as well out to the public. So that's the director's role, and then the IRAC role is to hear the appeal of the director's decision. Leader of the third party. Okay, I'm trying to trying to get that all in because all we hear is IRAC's decision. We yeah, don't hear, we don't and it's, it. it's really not. It, it's that's a simple way of thinking of it, but really it's not. The director works for IRAC, but the director makes. An initial, you know, the tenant or the landlord involved in a disagreement over the over their, you know, so there's a disagreement over their contract. They apply to the director for, you know, for uh, the director to look at it and agree with one side or the other. If the when the director makes their decision, that can be the end of it right there. And a lot of people would in the public would say that's Iraq making that decision, but it's not. It's the director's office. And then from there, if you disagree with the director's decision, you appeal to IRAC, and then as we spoke earlier, and then if you disagreed with that, you can actually go to court. But it, it's uh, uh, very, very rare that people go to court. So it's really the two-step process. So this, director, so this director has staff. Mm -hmm. They have an office. Yes. When it goes to IRAC, do they have designated people that deal with rental issues, or is it the whole IRAC board? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I've read through the decisions for the last few years, and it seems to be two people that hear them, the same two. Um, but I don't know if that's if that's set up in their policy or if that's just these are the two folks most comfortable. Okay. We so, have the third party. Thanks, Chair. So we're talking about Iraq. We're talking about director. We're talking about staff. We're talking about courts. We're talking about the Department of Social Development and Housing, and we're talking about the Department of Education. They're involved in it as well. Why isn't it under one umbrella? Why is it all over? Why is there so many bodies involved in this? It's a good question. So I'm not sure the full what happened behind the scenes. I came in and it was done. So it's, it's would be my answer. I'm not like honestly, it came in and said this this piece of legislation, we're going to move it to social development and housing for the responsibility for this piece of legislation. And that's when I as legislative drafter or, you know, the the legislative drafter come into the process. So I wasn't involved in the discussions that happened before that. Leader of the third party? Well, it would make sense that maybe that's something that should be looked at going forward, uh, to my thinking. And I look back every September, there's an announcement by, I don't know if it's the director and her staff or if it's IRAC, that says what rent should go up. Mm -hmm. So staff in the minister's department knows this. Do they not submit when the advertisement's in the paper that they'd like the input? They'd like to say that they think the rent should only go up one and a half till June and two after that, or we'll look at it in the future. Like, I see the ads in the paper. Mm -hmm. So does the department not have any comment to these ads, or is that done by the director, or is nobody says a word? Does so Iraq make the decision? Where, where it stands right now in the current act follows that process is, again, this act is overlooking an agreement between a landlord and a tenant. So when we look at who provides submissions, they are provided by landlords and tenants, is who is asked. And so that is in the old legislation and in this new legislation, it specifically says the director will call for submissions from landlords and tenants in relation to this act. It doesn't say it will call for people who aren't tenants or what have you. It's landlords and tenants who are asked to provide submissions because they are the folks affected by rental tenancy agreements. Leader of the third party, two more questions, I can put you back on the list. I have to think about my next question. Thank you. I'll put you Absolutely. back on the list if you want. Um, next, going to uh, Charlottetown Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. And 
I just just a little clarification. I think I know the answer to this, but when we were talking about the definition having changed for a mobile home mm -hmm. um, site, this doesn't impose any impose any additional obligations on um, mobile home renters. No, no. Okay. No, no. It's just it's greater clarification that when we talk about a mobile home site, it's the it's the parcel of land that the home is on that you're renting. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Charlton Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. And the definition of security deposit <laughs> includes money or any property. Does this mean that tenants can provide something other than money to be held as a security deposit? In the strict definition, yes, but I don't think that would be the normal process. But if there is, I think there is a, a, an ability there if, if the landlord and the tenant wanted to exchange something else, there, there is the ability there, but they'd both have to agree. And that's, I've never heard of that happening, but it is, there is some opening there. Yeah. Charlottetown Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm wondering about um, the definition, or sorry, service animal in this section. Mm -hmm. uh, means an animal that is specifically trained or being trained as a working animal for the purpose of providing assistance to a person with a disability and includes a retired service animal. Are, the, are there any specific training requirements that need to be met to qualify as a service animal under this act? Not under this act, no. Charlottetown Victoria Park. But again, there are, so I, I should clarify a little more. There are, um, when you look at it, there are schools that train service animals. And I, I, I can't speak for the director, but I believe that, you know, when an application came in, if somebody was... You know, this is my service animal, but it's not had any training. It's gone to, you know, a, a local trainer to have some basic training. They wouldn't, I don't think they would believe that that would, met the, start, the, the uh, status of a service animal. But again, that would be the director would have to look at that. And we have been contemplating as a province um, adding service animal legislation similar to some other provinces, where then it would be very clearly defined. Charlottetown Victoria Park and, and that was kind of my next question yeah. are there mm -hmm. any pieces of legislation in PEI where that is the case but not not as of now but no but we are it is it is on our list of let's review and do some research and see what you know see what we're missing in that area and do we need a piece of legislation Charlottetown Victoria Park um, and and I know that we've brought this to the department before. This is something that we we have heard concerns from community members about because um, there's challenges around service animals because um, there's no regulations around them. And so, um, how are we going to address any potential issues that arise because of that? Well, again, I think that's where the Service Animal Act would have to come in. Um, I mean, again, right now. In this act, we talk about a service animal, and I just want to read the, it's an animal that is specifically trained or being trained as a working animal. So that's what the, the director's office, I would presume, would look at if there was a disagreement. You know, if, if a tenant and a landlord had a disagreement and there was an application for the director to review, then I think the director would look at this definition and say, okay, I'll ask some questions. What training has this animal had? But it, it would be... Um, you know, if we had down the road an act that specifically said, here's the training you have to have, that would be even better. Charlottetown Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. And so in the absence of this legislation that you speak of, um, can a landlord verify whether an animal is a, is a service animal? Well, again, so this is, the landlord would probably say, I don't believe it is. And then the tenant could say, here's my proof that it is, and if they disagreed, then it would go, um, it would go to the director for, to hear, and the director would, as again, would hear the difference and say, okay, well, is that a service animal? Show me your proof. So I don't think a landlord can come in and say, you have to show me proof, but the landlord can say, I don't believe your animal is. And then the director could say, show me proof, or explain to me why in the, in the hearing. Charlottetown Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. So I guess that we've been hearing that this legislation would be coming forward the last couple of years, potentially, that we just keep hearing it's being worked on. So is there any plan to work on that? Because I do think that it's important. I mean, you know, if we need legislation, we need legislation. So any, do you have any idea, like, is this something that the department is working on? 
Um, do you have any idea how long it would be before we see any legislation like that? We haven't started drafting. We have started doing some jurisdictional scans in Canada to start looking at what other provinces have. Um, so the, the work is begun. So if you're saying, has it begun? Yes. Um, do we have a draft yet? No, we haven't started drafting yet. I, I had to get through this one. <laughs> That's Charlottetown, fair. Victoria Park. Maybe two more questions. I can put you back on the list. Great. That would be great, Chair. Um, so sometimes in a, in a piece of legislation, there's a, in the first or second, second section, there, um, there's a, th something that says that, that the legislation must be interpreted in a certain way. Mm -hmm. um, so just kind of what we had been talking about earlier, for example, the, the Children's Law Act. Um, and so kind of going back to what, what we had talked about before. So it's in the Children's Law Act, it says, uh, this act shall be construed and applied in a manner that is consistent with the United Nations Conventions on the Rights of the Child. And there's no provision requiring the statute to be construed and applied in a manner that's consistent with human rights. Um, so the and, Or the International Co Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. Um, which sets out the right to adequate housing. It's kind of what we were talking about earlier. So I guess I'm, I'm, why did we not go that route in the Residential Tenancy Act, much like the route of the Child, Child Law Act? So I guess there's a couple of things. I'm not very familiar with the Child Law Act, so, and, and again, I'm not, uh, you know, I, the legal advice that we were provided was that to put this in a preamble, that outlines that Canada is a signatory, which is a statement of fact. Um, so that's that's the route that we took. In Charlottetown, Victoria Park, maybe one more, I can put you back on the list. Yes, okay. Um, so what would be the legal effect of a preamble like that? It's, so there is an interpretation act that talks about what a preamble, and I don't know what I've, Again, I've talked to our legal folks that say, here's what the Interpretation Act says, a preamble is, and, and that's where that would be located. Can you put me back on your I can, for Thank sure. You. Thank you. Summerside, Wilma. Thank you, Chair. So I guess I'll pick up where uh, Charlottetown Victoria Park left off. It's my understanding that what is listed in a preamble really has the most weight if we end up before the courts and the court is trying to determine how to interpret something. They will look to the preamble, they will look to the debate that took place in the Legislative Assembly when that bill was being passed. Um, I suppose I'm curious because the only language around human rights that I saw was in the preamble and admittedly it's a big act and I haven't had a chance to check everything so I stand to be corrected on that. But if the language on that only lives in the preamble, my understanding of it is it's largely going to be uh, called into question only if we end up before the courts. It, was that sort of the intention? So I'm not sure it was the intention, but I think, I, I think when we talk about it in terms of the preamble, it's, it's making it clear to all that Canada has signed on to this and that government has rights and obligations. Where we have to be careful in this piece of legislation is landlord doesn't have an obligation to provide human rights. Yeah, that's right. So it's, this is more of the preamble, and it is talking about government and how government has an obligation. And part of government's obligation is to ensure that there's a piece of legislation that provides the rights to tenants, so that it's clearly spelled out. So, so that's, that's my understanding of why it's better off in a preamble, was that it, it really speaks to government, not necessarily the agreement between the tenant and landlord. Now, there's, you know, Lots in here that talks about the obligations of tenants and landlords and what happens when you break those obligations. Yeah. But it's not, if it's a human right, again, as the other member noted, it's really a human rights act. Oh, yeah. yeah. Summerside, Wilma. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I agree with that. I'm also curious, on the service animal component, I'm, I'd have to check the human rights act, but I don't know if you can ask someone yeah. about their service animal. I don't think you can. I don't um, think you can either. Uh, but it, and I know that it's in the Human Rights Act that you have to allow a service animal. Summerside, Wilma. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I definitely believe that you have to allow a service animal, but whenever uh, a, an individual is looking to rent a new unit, I don't know if the landlord has the right to make a lot of inquiries on whether or not this animal is a service animal versus a personal pet. I, and I we don't have legislation that would provide any sort of a framework on that, so I'm just curious how a landlord is to make that distinction. 
So again, it, it, it would be the, when you're talking about the agreement, so we have an agreement between, I'm the landlord, you're the tenant, we have an agreement. You bring an animal in. Let's say you didn't have one beforehand and the building said, no pets allowed. And you bring one in and say, this is a service animal, I require it because of this reason. Yeah. The landlord will either accept that or they won't. If they don't, that would be where they would go to the director and the director would have to take the line of questioning on, is this a service animal based on this definition? And again, the, part of this, when we really talk about this act, uh, I'm gonna come back to this, I, I bet you I'll say it a hundred times. Um, we're really trying to make sure that there's a system in place that doesn't, you know, it's quasi-judicial, there's a director, they're well-trained in housing, in housing disputes, and they hear the dispute without you having to go to court. Okay. So that's the idea of this, is the landlord and tenant have a dispute or a disagreement about their, their tenancy agreement. And so it goes to the director's office for application for review. And then if that's not agreed with, then the appeal. So I don't think the landlord has the right to come in and say, show me proof. I think probably how it would work in reality is the landlord would say, I disagree, I don't believe it is. And they may file to evict and say, that's not a service animal and we're a, pet, we're a no pets building. And that's not a service animal under the Human Rights Act. And then it would be up to the director to look at this definition, I think is how that would sort of work out. Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'm very familiar with the hearing and rent, uh, hearing process for both the director and Iraq because I've had a ton of constituents who have gone through it for all different mm -hmm. reasons. Definitely understand the idea of keeping that out of the courts. Mm -hmm. um, in the situation that you described, where you're the landlord and I'm the tenant, I already have a contract with you and I'm already in the unit and now I have a new service animal and the landlord can challenge that. I can definitely see that there would be time for me to have an appeal process and I couldn't be moved out of my unit before that order had been either decided on or set aside one way or the other. Mm -hmm. I definitely get that. But in the instance of a new unit where I'm applying for it, um, if there's no way for the landlord to inquire or demonstrate whether or not my animal is a service animal, uh, I'm just... Then your human rights would be, you would, you would feel that your human rights are being violated under the Human Rights Act and you would have filed through that process through the Human Rights Tribunal. Summers, I will not. Thank you, Chair. Do we know if, th this will be my last question on this point because I don't want to belabor it, it's just I do know a few individuals in my district who do have service animals. Mm -hmm. so it, it's a question that I want to be able to answer if it comes mm -hmm. up to me in my district, so I, I won't belabor this. I'm just trying to be clear on it. Is a landlord allowed to inquire if your animal is a service animal? Or do I'd have to bring that back to yeah. you. I've, if I've you never... would, I would just be really sure. curious to know. I, I don't need to know that right now, but that's, yeah. It would be helpful for me to have clarity on that. I don't know if that's something they're allowed to ask about, and I would hate for someone to be denied a unit that was available and was affordable because they had no way of demonstrating that their animal was valid under this act. Yeah, I, 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 I suspect that it's, it's the process, as I believe right now, is that the landlord would say, I don't, I don't agree that's a service animal, this is a pet, and then it would be human rights. But I would, I would rather find that out for sure than, than... Yeah. Summerside, Wilmot, two more, and then I can put you back in line. Actually, Chair, I don't have any other definitions questions, so I'm good for this section. Okay, thank you. Uh, Charlton Belvedere. Um, so while we've been talking, uh, there's literally been texts coming in from people who are absolutely panicked by this line of conversation around service animals. I think we need to be really careful if you don't know, not to speculate, because unfortunately, what you've just, some of what you've just said is incorrect, and it's okay. really, it's really worrying. Um, service providers, including business owners and landlords, have a duty to accommodate somebody with a disability. It is in the Human Rights Act, it's preeminent law, duty to accommodate. There are many visible and invisible disabilities that may require somebody to have a service animal, and if they have a service animal in PEI, we have no standardized training or identification, so you can't ask for identification or even training because we don't have any. The absence of that does make it much more difficult, but that doesn't mean it's then the onus is on the person with a disability to prove because we have a duty to accommodate. That's what that means. And what's happening here is that you're telling people that they can challenge that 
the challenge we also have is that the Human Rights Commission is swamped. Um, it takes them years to hear, to hear cases. Um, and this, so it's really concerning that we have a definition here which is really important. And if we're going to speak to that definition, we need to know what the information is. This is not something to be taken lightly. We do have a gap, absolutely. I don't necessarily not think that legislation is the route to go because it's actually, there's a lot to do with that. We need a registry, we need a way to certify, we need a way to validate training. That it's, it's, there's a lot of work to do in that, but there is no doubt that there are people with disabilities who rely on their service animals and have a right to have those animals. Um, it would be good to be clear that in terms of social, in terms of housing, if a client has a service animal, um, you can absolutely, what you can ask legally is, is this animal assisting you with a disability? And what assistance has this animal been trained to provide relating to the disability? You can't ask what somebody's disability is. You can't ask what training they've had. And the animal is under the same rules as the tenant would be, quiet, right, and enjoyment. So if the dog's out of control or the animal's out of control all the time, that would be totally fair for a complaint to be made. The expectation is the animal is trained. But landlords just don't have the right to start evicting people because they think that that service animal is a pet. There has to be something a little bit more rigorous. So I would really ask your department, or whoever's department it is that has this legislation after we're done, to make that a priority in communication. And the Human Rights Commission has fantastic resources available. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. Just put out an education campaign to landlords and say, here's how this works. Okay. And I think that would be a really great way to sort of cut off a lot of this misinformation, because my worry is people are going to interpret this 16 different ways when it's actually pretty clear. We may not like it, but it's pretty clear. So, so that they, they have that information and they're ready to go, and I think that could be a real value to the community. Mm -hmm. So I, I thank you, Chair, for the opportunity, but it's just, it, was, it was spiraling, and I'm, 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 I've literally got somebody really concerned on the other end of my phone saying, you know, this isn't actually how it works. So thank you for the right, opportunity. Well, my apologies. Speak. Thank you, Member. No, I thank you, Verena, for the chance to be able to, to get something on record. Thanks. Thank you, Charlotte Hotel Belvedere. Uh, Mermaid Strafford. Thanks, Chair. And I was just going to kind of add on to, there is a two-page report out by the Human Rights Commission that clearly defines what you can do and how you recognize a service animal. So that, I was just going to add that, and I don't, I, I would agree with Charlottetown Belvedere. There has been a real, they've done a really good job in defining it. Like, one of the examples of work performed by a service animal is distracting a person from repetitive and obsessive thoughts and actions. Like, that's clear, but a person with disability shouldn't have to tell that to their t to their landlord right so um and uh, if i if i pass that as what was was happening i, I, I okay. because i did know that yeah um, I, I have a friend who has a service animal for that reason and i yeah. do know that you know there is a process in place but um so i i'm sorry i may have you know when trying to be forthright i may have gone too far it sounds like i went too far so I'll get the proper answer back, and, and okay. thank you for that. Yeah, and I can Mermaid Strafford. And I can share the link of this two pager in case you don't already have it. But I think that that's human rights. That's human rights. Uh, it's the yeah. Human rights yeah. 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 Okay, that's it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mermaid Strafford. Charles on Victoria Park. Um, I think, Chair, that we are good. I'm good for this section. Thank you. Shall section one carry? Carried. Carried. Carry. Section two. Uh, what this act applies to? Are there any questions? Charlottetown Victoria Park. Thank you, sir. I'm just wondering, there's a new subsection three, and I'm wondering if you can explain where that comes from, what that what that means. The purpose of it. Subsection two? Sorry. In section oh, yes, two, yeah. subsection yes. three. Yes, I can, yeah. yeah. Sorry. So section sections two and three, so let me just double check the So sections two and three uh, refer to sections within a current form under the, so there, there are a number of forms that are used for tenancy agreements. And if you get into the form, it had something in there that said, oh gosh, now we're getting deep into it here. Um, it talked about this being in, 
So it's talked about the current Form 1 standard form of rental agreement in the regulations of the Rental of Residential Property Act, which point to eviction timelines and call for the current Act, which are less than the new Act calls for. So this is saying that with respect to a tenancy agreement entered into before the date of the Act comes into force, Sections 2, oh, right, yes, so Sections 2 and 3 do not apply, and four, Part 4 of this Act does. So what we're really getting down to is we've got new timelines in this Act. Some have changed from two months to four or two months to six. Those four, four and six apply, even if the agreement was enforced beforehand, if the tenant agreement was signed before this Act comes into force. Sorry. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for that. So basically, it's just kind of saying that here, up here on out, this is what this is the law of the land. Sort of. For it, yeah, okay. For that, for that specific part of that form. Okay, I'm Sh good for that section. Good. Uh, shall the section two care uh, pass? Carry. Carry. Thank you. <laughs> uh, section three act applies to tenancy agreement with a minor. Shall it carry? Carry. Section four. What this act does not apply to. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Um, so I'm looking at uh, Clause A, and I'm wondering why the requirements for two months or more there. It's, it, it just seems kind of funny. So the two months or more really speaks to, and it's, it's under the Tourism Act. So there are hotels that have people come in for the winter, and this act, so it's more than two months, but it's, it's for the two months or less is when we're talking about standard rentals. So... Um, it, just in terms of your standard rentals over the summer, like for a weekly rental, or you know, I'm, I'm here on as a tourist, I'm, I'm visiting. They can't. That you know, we, we wouldn't go through the application process with the director. Um, it's not an eviction. Your your time is up. You move out. But if you get into a longer term rental over the winter, then some of these then some of these apply. Some of the sections apply of the act in terms of now it's becoming a long term agreement. But it also yeah so. That's what that's point focusing to. Okay. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm moving down to Clause D now. Would this also include community care facilities? Yes. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. Is does that would that fall does that fall under the facility established to provide personal care for persons? I believe so. Yes. Yeah. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. Okay, so uh, Clause E. Um, I'm wondering, uh, so this one's about living accommodation owned or operated by an educational institution and provided by that institution to its students, just for the record. Mm -hmm. um, as a result of the housing crisis, some of our educational um, institutions like UPEI have partnered with third-party accommodation providers to provide housing. Um, would this act apply to that sort of situation? I'm not sure. Um, Education should provide it by that institution to its students. I'm not, I'm not sure. I'd have to bring that back. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. I would appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and so what tenancy protections would university students living in university accommodations have? Would that apply there? So the intention of this particular clause is similar um, so we have, we have students who come in for the year, and then the, the intention often for UPEI or Holland College is to rent the building out in the summer. And so the idea here is to make sure that it's clear that students don't stay for longer than the period of time of the school year. And it allows the, you know, Holland College, I think, is quite well known to rent their units in the summertime as summer accommodations. So to make it clear that tenants, you know, there has to either be an agreement with the student and the school to say, I'm staying year round. And if the school says, no, this is for the school year, and then during the summer, you must find another accommodation, that the school has the ability to do that. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. 
Thank you, Chair. And that's that's a whole other kettle of fish, the, some of the issues that we're seeing around that with students having to leave for two weeks at Christmas time sometimes and, and in the summer, that's, that's kind of becoming a, a whole new issue um, that our housing crisis isn't helping with much. Um, so moving on to F, which is uh, living accommodation provided for the purposes of accommodating the needs of children, youth, or persons in the custody of the Director of Child Protection under the Child Protection Act of PEI. Um, I'm wondering if there's, if, if for this clause there's been any um, consultation with the child and youth advocate and I'm wondering kind of in general if that's something that was done with the Residential Tenancy Act, if there was any chats with him. Not on this act, no. Charlottetown Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I guess on that. Um, I can go on to, there is other, other members if you'd like. Yeah, that would be good. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Chair. Just had a couple of questions on this section, but particularly um, J, what this act does not apply to, tenancy agreements, rental units, or residential properties prescribed by the regulations. Can you give me an example of what tenancy agreements, rental units, or residential properties we are imagining here that the act would not apply to? Yes, I can give you one. Um, so government has a new building, um, a new program coming out that would have uh, ch children or, you know, a youth who used to be in the care of the director who are now uh, going to be provided services, uh, expanded services under the new Child Protection Act. And those folks would be living in the, the, the new facility that's just been built. I believe it's on Beach Grove Road. And that building itself has a different set of a different set of um, criteria than a rental unit would have in terms of the the tenant has to meet you know that there's a plan in place for the tenant to meet certain goals as part of this program, and so that would be that would where that building itself would be that's the one that's the main one in here for this is to have that in there. When we were built when we were doing the act, we don't quite have the name of it yet. We don't quite have the name, so it's going to have to be in the regulations. But it would be similar to the Child Protection Act in terms of, although this would be for adults who've moved out, so I think it's age 18 to 25. Th thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vernon. Um, unfortunately, it is uh, four o'clock, oh, so we are oh, going to uh, switch over to uh, opposition time. So uh, thank you both uh, for joining us this afternoon. Mr. Chair, I move the speaker take the chair and the chair report progress and beg leave to sit again. Shall I carry? Carry. 12, 12 more hours to go. <laughs> 113 left. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, as Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, having a head under consideration a bill to be intituled Bill Number 87, the Residential Tenancy Act, I beg leave to report that the committee has made some progress and begs to leave to sit again. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. Shut up, Gary. Gary. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. The Honourable Member for Mermaid Stratford and the Opposition House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I ask the motion 124 be now read. Shall carry? Carry. Is that what we asked? Pardon? Motion 124. The Member for Charlottetown Belvedere moves, seconded by the Member for Charlottetown Victoria Park, the following motion. Whereas unintended pregnancy and access to contraception have been flagged as key issues in women's health. And whereas unintended pregnancies take a toll on the mental health and well-being of all affected persons and their families, and the impacts are greatest among youths. 
And whereas in 2014, unintended pregnancies accounted for over 80% of all pregnancies among Canadian youth under 20. And whereas youth parenting is associated with lower lifetime educational achievement, lower income, and increased reliance on social support programs. And whereas timely access to effective contraception reduces the incidence of unintended pregnancy. And whereas cost is a significant barrier to using contraception for many islanders, especially those in low income or youth. And whereas the most effective contraceptives with the lowest lifetime costs, intrauterine devices, have the highest upfront costs and are used by only a tiny fraction of women. And whereas confidentiality may also be a factor, especially among youth, who may be reluctant to access contraceptives through their family doctor or via their parents' health insurance. Therefore, be it resolved that the Legislative Assembly urge government to allow pharmacists to prescribe oral contraceptives and refer for intrauterine devices. <coughs> And therefore, be it further resolved that the Legislative Assembly urge government to fully cover the cost as pair of last resort for those over 18 for both oral contraceptives and intrauterine devices. Okay, I'll ask the mover of the motion, Charlottetown Belvedere, to start debate. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to bring this uh, motion to the floor. We've uh, had many discussions in the House and here about um, provision of health care for women. Um, whether that be through discussion of um, some of the realities around things like endometriosis or whether it is around you know, specific issues that we've talked about, the importance of um, being able to get pres uh, prescribed support for UTIs at pharmacists and how much that impacts quality of life. But this is something that um, I think would have an absolutely incredible impact um, on, in ways that we perhaps may not be able to necessarily recognize right away. So one of the opportunities we have with this motion is to have an honest conversation about access to contraception as a reproductive right, which is actually a basic human right. We've just been talking about human rights and how they apply to the right to adequate housing. And just like other things that you may not realize, access to reproductive rights, being able to make informed and personal decisions about your right to have a child or not, is a human right. However, many Canadians are unable to exercise this right for a variety of reasons. One of these reasons is the significant barrier of cost. People who can get pregnant are disproportionately affected by the often high costs of contraception, and it means they may not also, also be able to make their own choices about what contraception they can afford. These costs can extend to between $100 up to $500 for an IUD, an intrauterine device, $20 on average per month for oral contraceptives, and up to $200 per year for hormone injections, just to cover the most common uh, choices. Lack of coverage financially for contraception means youth, people with low income, newcomers, and those from marginalized communities face a severe disadvantage when making choices about their bodies. Therefore, Acknowledging the factor of cost is essential to making universal access to contraception a reality. Prescription co contraception is free in a number of OECD countries, including the UK. My experience in the UK was you could go to a, a high street family planning clinic, they're called the Mary Stokes Clinic, and with a minimal amount of information, get any support that you wanted, including contraceptives, and walk back out the door. In the UK, with the 15 options to choose from, it also is extended to residents who are not citizens, which is critical when we talk about the support for newcomers and new, new Canadians. Mr. Speaker, did you know that it was actually illegal to advertise or sell birth control in Canada until 1969? Under the, and it was a criminal code offence, if you did. Despite that, family planning has been provided for as long as you can imagine. It may have not necessarily been what you'd expect, but it meant women always take care of other women, Mr. Speaker, and, and absolutely family planning was available, but it was actually criminal to sell or provide contraception support until 1969. I was born in 1969, Mr. Speaker, not that long ago. Maybe a little bit longer than everybody else, but yeah. Nowadays, the average Canadian seeking prescription contraception can access it fairly easily enough if they have a family doctor which well, it could be a little bit of a challenge, or a health care provider in some cases. The catch is, if they can manage to get that referral, they have to pay for it. In any given year, 
Mr. Speaker, 60% of all pregnancies are unplanned in Canada, 60% of all pregnancies. 60,000 young Canadians under the age of 24 experienced unplanned pregnancies in 2014, which is the last time we have data, so it's much, surely much higher now. But it's because over 25% of youth who don't wish to be pregnant reported that they didn't use contraception during every act of intercourse, and some never used it at all. And it's not necessarily because they didn't want to, but because they didn't have it available to them. The statistics for immigrants are just as worrying. 25% of immigrant women said they had problems getting birth control, compared to only 15% of Canadian-born women. The barriers they face could include language, lack of access to private insurance, the challenges of navigating a healthcare system different from the one in their home country. The ongoing challenges with healthcare and the access to primary care providers is one of the reasons why looking at pharmacists as a frontline provider of service for something as simple as oral contraception or the referral for more in-depth excuse the pun, <laughs> contraception like an IUD, um, is the reason that, that, that that's actually been a recommendation for a number of years when we talk about expansion of practice, scope of practice for pharmacists. It's been on the list, I don't know, as long as I can think of. Um, and it is a relatively straightforward um, opportunity to provide that expansion of care. Imagine if you could just go to your pharmacist and be prescribed oral contraceptives. Not only does that mean that you no longer have to have Find oral contraceptive. <laughs> <laughs> that, that means that no longer do you have to um, get a doctor's referral before you can even get a prescription to be filled, but it also means that it, it addresses a lot of many other challenges that, that arise when we have a looking at needing a primary care provider. It means that you have more confidentiality in the decision that you choose to make, particularly perhaps if your family doesn't support your choice of being sexually active. It means that you can um, have the choice of what you, what you pick in terms of, uh, of the, the, the contraceptive choices that you have. And Mr. Speaker, you know, we can't pretend that youth are not having sex. They absolutely are, they always have been, they always will be, and unintended pregnancies are gonna happen. So access to contraception allows people to make choices. It allows them to make better choices, and those choices impact the rest of their lives. Under our current primary care policies, an IUD may not be covered because they're considered a med medical device rather than a form of medication, like oral contraceptives. But people with a uterus deserve the right to make healthcare choices, including in their contraception that best meets their health need. Not everybody can take oral contraceptives. The, the, basically, taking an oral hormone does not work for everybody. It may contra it contradict with um, other medication that they take. They may just not react well to it. For some women, that means that they get terrible side effects that they just can't bear. It can also lead, in some cases, to severe mental health challenges including severe depression. So it is not the solution for everybody. An IUD, though, that starts at $500 and requires a medical referral to get the prescription to then get the IUD to then go back and have it inserted, which is not fun, Mr. Speaker, speaking from experience, probably one of the most painful things I have ever done without anesthetic. Um, and that's another whole conversation. Why don't we anesthetize for IUDs? But we'll talk about that another time. <laughs> yeah. But you know, if you have to drop $500 out of your own pocket, you're going to think twice about that as an option, even though that may actually be the least um, damaging, most flexible, and best choice for you as contraception. It's actually the most reliable form of contraception um, that a woman can have, particularly recommended for women who've already had a child and want to then manage their fertility after having a child, and for older women. It's important to remember that 58% of oral contraception users use the pill for at least one purpose other than pre pre pregnancy prevention as well. It's actually really common for particularly young women to be prescribed, um, in fact, 31% of those 58%, so a third of everybody who takes oral contraceptives have been prescribed those for cramps or menstrual pain. We had talked in here about endometriosis and the crippling effects of that. One of the most effective early interventions for endometriosis is oral contraceptives. So nothing to do with, um, with preventing unintended pregnancies, though obviously that's a nice side effect, but it, because of the way that it affects and makes changes in the body to reduce the potential impact of endometriosis. 
Contraceptives can also help regulate menstruation cycles, decrease acne, and help treat medical health issues like polycystic ovarian syndrome, another very serious um, illness for women and, and those who have uteruses. The need for no-cost contraception has been highlighted with the impacts of the pandemic and financial insecurity. If you are experiencing in income insecurity or job loss, or you lose your private health insurance coverage, or you can no longer be sure of your income, you may no longer be able to afford the cost of recurring medications. And it should not be a choice that something like contraception is a nice to have rather than a must to have when the outcome is an unintended pregnancy. Some contraceptive methods like IUDs and hormone injections need to be administered by a healthcare professional and require in-person visits to do so, as well as getting that original prescription. And during the pandemic, that proved really difficult. If you need to get an annual hormone injection and you've missed your appointment because you couldn't leave your house, then again, you are then beginning to reduce the impact and the effectiveness of that, of that, um, excuse me, that medication. But, Mr. Speaker, we've learned in this House that one of the biggest incentives for governments to consider universal anything to do with health care is if you can show how much money it's going to save. It worked for us with diabetes when we talked about insulin pumps. It's worked for a whole bunch of other things, so we're going to do the same thing with contraception, Mr. Speaker. It will save money for the government, a significant amount of money. According to a study by Access BC, uh, a nonprofit that, that, that focuses on providing contraception for women in British Columbia, Programs that offer free prescription contraception to women are revenue positive because the cost of providing free prescription contraception to women is considerably lower than the costs associated with unintended pregnancies. And that excludes the long-term social costs. That's only measuring medical costs, Mr. Speaker. In fact, a 2015 study estimated the cost of delivering universal contraception in Canada at $157 million but with savings in the form of direct medical costs from unintended pregnancy at $320 million. That's also almost double. That is absolutely revenue positive. And this, this study was, was 2015. It's old. So we're seven years later. Things are an awful lot more expensive. You can just imagine the difference there, Mr. Speaker. The ratios have remained the same. Access, though, to free prescription contraception is seen as a special interest issue. So how the rights of half of the entire population could be considered a special interest issue is beyond me. <laughs> almost, almost everyone has either used contraception or benefited from the use of contraception. It is not a special interest issue. Mr. Speaker, vasectomies are covered under our provincial health care plan. Condoms are provided free of charge in high schools and are, you can buy them at the gas station, but you can't get oral prescription contraception. Mr. Speaker, unintended pregnancies, pregnancies that you did not plan, are not always a miracle. In fact, they're often not a miracle. They are expensive. They can significantly alter an individual's life plans. They're not always wanted. They're not always an occasion for celebration. And I know that's really hard to hear, but that's the reality. No 14-year-old is going to be thrilled to find out that she's pregnant because she had a really fun night at the party two weeks ago or six weeks ago, whenever the party was. What will happen to her is social and economically, socially and economically devastating, damaging to the physical and mental health of the pregnant person. And it is naive to think that if we continue to preach abstinence, that somehow that's going to make it go away. Always from when, well, I remember being in high school like I said, old, in the 80s, and the kids would disappear and go to Boston for six months. I think we can all probably remember something like that, Mr. Speaker. They would go for six months, and they were going to visit the aunt in Boston. Because, you, you know, at that time, because it is a long time ago, you, you, know, you couldn't be pregnant in high school. Um, and so you would go away, and you would have a baby. And I don't know what happened to the baby. Maybe it became a magic younger sister or got adopted, but everybody knew what had happened. And the youngest person I remember that happening to back in the 1980s was in grade six. And that's still the case, Mr. Speaker. Kids are sexually active. It is more and more common for it to be very casual. It's just the way that things are, and we can be uncomfortable about it. But pretending that we shouldn't be providing youth 
with access to make better and informed choices is inappropriate and we are doing them a disservice. We are doing them a disservice, Mr. Speaker, and one of the barriers that we have is how you have to, the route you have to go. You have to have a supportive adult in your life who can take you to the doctor. And in fact, it usually has to be a parent or a guardian. Though legally, as far as I'm aware, and I'm prepared to be challenged on it, but legally, children can make their own informed medical decisions. We've had this conversation regarding vaccinations recently. If somebody wants to be vaccinated and they're 13 or 14 or whatever, they can. So somebody who's 13 or 14 or 15 should be able to go to the pharmacist and say, I would like to have some oral, oral contraceptives, please. And then the pharmacist would have a conversation with them about the risks and how to take them safely and how much, that they're not 100% effective and how to make sure that they are as effective as possible. And then they would give them that prescription and wave goodbye. With no money exchanging hands and no report to the parents and no judgment and no lecture and no kind of official course on how abstinence would be better. This is the reality that we're in. And Mr. Speaker, it really wouldn't be that hard. Access to contraception is not only an issue of health and money. Contraception is also an issue of gender equality, Mr. Speaker. We have condoms available, free or low cost, like I said, at the gas station or the grocery store. Vasectomies under the provincial health care plan. People with uteruses face significant barriers to contraception that are completely different than those who do not, due to cost and the requirement of prescription. These are barriers that are gender specific. And that is actually a breach of our human rights. ReproductiveRights.org states, advancing gender equality requires recognizing that the cost of prescription contraception should not disproportionately fall on women alone. Women's rights to decide if and when they want to get pregnant should not be based on what they can afford or their socioeconomic status or influence. The ability to make that decision freely will contribute to the status of women, their right to health, and their empowerment as decision makers and equal participants in society. Mr. Speaker, it seems like a really small thing to ask, but it is revenue positive. It is forward thinking. It is simple to deliver. It is within our budget capacity. It is within our operational capacity. It is down to a decision in government to make it so. And Mr. Speaker, I am asking this House and those of the people in the House who are paying attention, thank you very much, I am asking for this House to truly consider how impactful it would be and what message it would send to the women in this province and those who are able to have children, and particularly to our youth, that we trust them and believe that they have the same rights to make their own informed choices about what they do with their bodies as every other citizen in the province. And with that, I conclude my remarks, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. <clears throat> And uh, of course, I, I support this motion. Um, I'd like to just begin by reminding the House that we did pass a motion on this back in 2019 where we were asking for improved, um, what was it called, universal access to contraceptives for those under 25, which did pass. Um, so this isn't so far out there. We've already had this discussion and everyone agreed it was important. So. Uh, here we are again. And, and I'd also, before I get started, would like to say that in a motion, when we're talking about a motion like this, um, women's health care, we always have to keep in mind that it's not just women who can get pregnant. Um, and so we're actually talking about any persons with a uterus. And so in trying to be respectful, sometimes I might jump back to women because, mm -hmm. I mean, that's kind of, that's the, the language that we've always used. And so as we kind of learn how to use more gender, gender neutral language, this is kind of what we have right now. So please know that I, I say this all with, with great respect to regardless of, of your gender, if you're, you know, I'm speaking for anyone who's able to, to get pregnant. Um, this is, this is, uh, 
con access to contraception is absolutely a health care issue. Having autonomy over one's body is a health care issue. And there's so many barriers that people face when, when trying to access them. And, and depending on your age, those barriers can look a little bit different and, and, and not all at the same time. And, you know, as we stand here, as I listen to the member from um, Charlottetown Belvedere speak, I started to think about the fact that, you know, we can't assume or judge that we understand where a pregnancy came from, that some pregnancies are consensual, some are not, mm -hmm. some are surprises, some are not. And so we can't pass judgment on why anyone would be looking for contraception. And if you consider um, a teenager's barriers, Mr. Speaker, or, or someone who is a youth, you know, it might be that they have to go through their parents' insurance and they don't want to. Um, they're too scared. Their parents will say no. And c growing up, I know that the education system is is altering and, and changing and evolving, which is, is what we need to happen. And so, um, you know, we've, we're growing away from, hope we are, hope all, we all are from this notion that abstinence is the only way. We need to have these discussions because whether someone is sexually active or not, this is education. And so having access to being able to prevent a pregnancy, having access to that information alone is really empowering. And we need to follow that up. If we, if, if you know, any person understands that contraception prevents pregnancies, and they know that, and they're well educated, yet, you know, they're held up by a barrier, um, their parents' insurance, or, you know, maybe it's, it's a person whose partner has um, control over the finances or control over that insurance, and, and they have no autonomy over their body. And so we really can't, I guess I'm kind of going back to the point that we just can't pass judgment on why someone might be looking for that. You know, there might be reasons of confidentiality that, that people don't want to, um, to they, confidentiality reasons they want to keep it quieter. Um, they may have no access to a family doctor. And contraception, I mean, as was also mentioned, you know, if you're a man looking for contra contraception, go to the drugstore, go to the gas station. You know, here's a free condom for you, for you, for you, you know, but if you're a woman, you have, you don't have that access to protect yourself from sexually transmitted infections, from unwanted pregnancies. You just don't have that. And if we're talking, I mean, I don't know the statistics on this, but the amount of um, non-consensual sexual activity that leads to pregnancies, I mean, if a person had access to oral contraceptives contraception or an IUD, that would add a layer of protection for them because while we want people to have autonomy over their body, sometimes they don't have any control over what happens to their bodies. And so that is another reason why this is really important. And of course, cost is, is another barrier that, that we are well aware of. And if you're a young person, if you're someone living on social assistance, if you're someone living in poverty, you know you know what you need for your body, but you just can't afford it. And so I think that, you know, as we consider women's health, it's something that the, the member from Mermaid Stratford and I will often talk about being excited to have a motion um, on women's health. And so if we consider contraception, absolutely, this is another example of that. It's something that we don't understand. We don't understand it. Because uh, I'm going to say it again, if you're a man, you can walk in anywhere and get something to protect yourself from the burden of getting someone pregnant or from catching um, an, a sexually transmitted infection. You have those options at your fingertips, but women don't. And so women are left, you know, if they don't have access to this, women are left to trusting the person that they're wor with to not get them pregnant or to not pass on a sexually transmitted infection. And as you consider non-consensual sexual activity, that's just, this is a layer of protection that we just can't afford not to have. And as we talk about, um, 
as I read this clause in the whereas, whereas youth parenting is associated with lower lifetime educational achievement, lower income, and increased reliance on social supports program. You know, like if you think there are so many stories, I have so many friends and acquaintances whose parents had them at a very young age and they do tend to find themselves stuck in this, this vicious cycle. And it's harder to get out when you've got the responsibility of a child. You know, if you're a young person who had planned on you know, graduating from high school and going on to post-secondary education and you end up pregnant, um, that really has the potential to alter your whole life, your whole life. It changes who you are as a person because you weren't able to go after some of your goals unless you've got a really incredibly supportive network of people behind you who may allow, you know, who may, um, may uh, make access to abortion or, uh, you know, support whatever it is that that young person wants. Um, and so it's ab absolutely, I, as we consider the cost of this, I would say the social costs of this, we would see, I, I, this is a preventative, this is very preventative. You know, if someone wants to have a child, they will. And if they have access to this, they have that choice, which is, you know, better outcomes for the child and better outcomes for the person having the child. Because a child's not being asked to be born, and if they're born into a situation where they're a surprise, you know, sometimes surprises are really pleasant, you know, and really exciting. And, and as I speak to this, it's not lost on me that there's many people who would love to have children and they can't. That is not lost on me. Um, but if you consider uh, the cost to that child's whole life, if they don't have support, if they don't have, you know, we're, we're a community of people who, you know, this is about um, uh, if you're, if you think that people have, you know, the right to life, then, you know, that means a baby is born and that you believe they should be taken care of their whole entire life. It's not just that you want babies to be born for the sake of being born because you're, you know, against abortion. Mm -hmm. So it's important to remember all of these things as we consider it. Um, uh, so I, I'm going to move on from my remarks, but I guess I, I will just conclude by saying this is just the right thing to do. As one thing that I've said a, a few times in the House, and I think that most of us in here would agree because of what we've learned. I'm thinking of the Health and Social Development Committee meeting recently where we were listening to the supported decision making where they talked about human rights. And, and when human rights change, then so too do our practices, so too do our policies. And it's against a human right to not advance with knowledge. And I would say that this is a good example of that because when we give people universal free access to, to contraception of their choice, then we are empowering them and we're giving them autonomy and we're giving them the available, to, uh, th giving them the right to make choices. And so with that, Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for, from Shawtown Bel Belvedere for bringing this forward and I look forward to hearing what others have to say about this and for support on this motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Minister of Education and Lifelong Learning, Minister responsible for the status of women. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and thank you, Honourable Member, for bringing the motion forward. I certainly appreciated uh, the discussion thus far. It's a topic uh, that's of great interest to me as both Education Minister as well as the Minister responsible uh, for the status of women, so I'm pleased to speak to this today. Uh, Mr. Speaker, within our public school system, our health curriculum teaches students that everyone needs information on contraception and, and safe, safer sex. Uh, teachers teach students to examine methods for contraception or barriers and the benefits and disadvan disadvantages of each method. These, of course, are, are complex and sensitive conversations. We have supports and coaching available for our teachers to help them frame these discussions uh, in appropriate and, and sensitive ways. Through our health curriculum, teachers' discussion topics, um, they include um, physical consequences of not only contraceptives or engaging in safer sex, 
emotional consequences and safer sex practices such as co using condoms and effective contraception, where to seek help or obtain contraception, exploring statistics on safer sex practices, learning about various types of contraception and the effectiveness of multiple types of contraception. Public health nurses and the student well-being teams, comprehensive school health nurses are arranged to do condom demonstrations with intermediate classes and to provide various presentations to students to support learning about contraceptives and safer sex practices. Students are welcome to speak at any time to any one of the school counselors or nurses on this topic. In school, student services often have free condoms for students as well as pregnancy tests available. Often, counselors or teachers will help students set up appointments to meet with a pharmacist, public health, or the women's clinic so they can learn about other forms of contraceptives. I am grateful for the many teachers and school staff who are working with our students and have these very important uh, and sometimes difficult conversations. We also have financial support and um, supports and health and wellness resources at the post-secondary level so that post-secondary students have access to the supports they need as well. Yet I agree, there is still much work to be done and again, that's why I'm really happy that we're, we're uh, discussing this today. When we look at our province, I know we are making progress in the area of women's health, uh, but we, we can and we will do more. The Interministerial Women's Secretariat and the PEI Advisory Council on the Status of Women have played an active role in the development of the Department of Health and Wellness's health strategy for women and islanders who are gender diverse. Both the IWS and ACSW continue to play an integral role as the strategy is being implemented. One of the, one of the initiatives outlined in the strategy is to support access to all types of contraception. We see this as a vitally important initiative that will have a positive impact on the lives of Islanders. Government is committed to providing quality programs and services to all residents of Prince Edward Island. It's important that we develop programs to meet the unique needs of Islanders. And we are very excited to, to participate in the development of this initiative with the Department um, of Health and Wellness and to support access to contraception for island women and gender diverse people. So with that, my, that Mr. Speaker, I'm, uh, I'm pleased to support this motion and certainly thank the Honourable Member for bringing it forward. The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I, like my uh, colleague, uh, the Minister of Education, Lifelong Learning, uh, I want to thank uh, the mover and the seconder of the motion for bringing it forward. And uh, I will start off, my remarks are going to be brief, Mr. Speaker. I'll uh, start off by uh, stating explicitly I will be supporting this motion. And again, uh, thank you for bringing it uh, forward. But. Uh, just briefly, Mr. Speaker, I would like to touch on a couple of, of things that, you know, again, my appreciation to the mover and the seconder, but also to staff for the great work that they have done with regard to the development, the consultation on uh, the health strategy for women and islanders who are gender diverse. And Mr. Speaker, uh, that uh, uh, steering committee, it was launched in June 2022, the report, I should say, the strategy, um, with four goals and ten initiatives. And uh, the steering committee served the Implementation Council, its inaugural meeting with representation from right across the province. Um, it was held on October 11th of this year, Mr. Speaker. And I did have the pleasure to, uh, to attend that inaugural meeting. But uh, you look, as I uh, referenced, four goals, ten initiatives. And the second goal, expand available accessible services and care. And one of the proponents, or one of the bullets under that uh, goal, one of the initiatives, is with regard to support access to contraception which certainly fits right in with the motion that has been brought forward here today. And as I'd mentioned, Mr. Speaker, I'm not going to uh, speak uh, uh, for an extended time period on this. Uh, the seconder of the motion did reference, though, and 
very eloquently, I would have to say, that there are a number of, uh, of ones that struggle to become pregnant, even though they do want to. Um, and that's one of the things, too, that we have taken action on. We can always improve. We can always strive to do better. But, uh, for example, Mr. Speaker, the fertility treatment program that our government launched on uh, the 1st of January of 2021. And those are the types of initiatives that, uh, you know, that we have to be open to, but we have to be open-minded to. I think back to another motion, too, that would have been probably about, uh, well, be a number of months ago. And uh, I have to thank my critic uh, on the far side of the House uh, in uh, the official opposition. But it was with regard to endometriosis. And we had, from my perspective anyway, subsequent to that, a great meeting with, uh, uh, with my critic and uh, uh, just a fantastic spokesperson, spokeswoman for that condition. Uh, it was, I'll be quite frank, it was an eye-opener to me. And as a result of that, and uh, it sort of, I guess I would say, in conjunction with the strategy that I referenced here, work is being undertaken on that, as I'm sure the honorable member is aware of, with uh, the individual that uh, met with us, that I had the pleasure to meet with in my office that day as part of that committee. So uh, again, uh, Mr. Speaker, thank the mover, thank the seconder, and again, I will be supporting the motion. Summerside, Wilmot. Sure to have an opportunity to speak to this. I don't intend to speak to it long, but I do think it's an important motion and it's one worthy of discussion. I appreciate the other two members from the other side of the House who did get up to speak to this, and I think the more of us who lend our voice to it, the better. So thank you both for bringing remarks. We heard from the Minister of Education about a number of education initiatives that are taking place in schools, which are very important. There's certainly more conversation about this in the classroom than there was before, but I wouldn't want us to think that education alone solves that gap, because there really is a balance on access there. If we're talking about male uh, individuals, they certainly have access to condoms at every opportunity. Again, the Minister of Education pointed out that we have access to free condoms in schools, but that does nothing for women. It does nothing for those of us who have uteruses. It's really critical that what we do is allow access through pharmacists. We do need access to oral contraceptives, and I must say that I think free pregnancy tests sort of misses the point of this motion. I feel like talking about being able to access free pregnancy tests in schools means we've already missed the opportunity to support someone. That, that is not a great example in this moment. Uh, I genuinely believe that what we need to do is make it more accessible for particularly young women, for particularly young gender diverse folks to be able to get access in a confidential way to the hormonal contraceptives that they need so they don't get pregnant in the first place. We can have all the education campaigns in the world, but if I can't get the supplies, then that's for nothing. You know, if I don't have a parent who is comfortable with me going ahead with this, if they are not comfortable talking about sex education, if they're not comfortable with me going to my doctor, then I have a barrier, and it's a barrier that's going to end up in a pregnancy that's unwanted, probably. So education is great, it's important, but we can't, we can't speak about that as if it's the finished product, like we're done. I strongly applaud my colleagues for bringing this forward. I definitely think access to um, oral contraceptives in pharmacies is a critical component that's missing, and I look forward to seeing unanimous support from all members in the House on this. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown, West Royalty, third party house leader. Oh, thank you. Mr. Speaker, and it's a pleasure to rise and to, to hear the debate and, and to talk about this. And I'm the women's critic on this side, and, and you know, it's it's something that I, I'm glad I have been. And I, 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 have, I have really take that 
that role seriously to, to listen and to learn and to, to do as best I can. And it's, it's good to have, I think, uh, a complete and wholesome discussion. And I want to thank the mover for, for bringing this forward. And this has a lot to do with, you know, communication, access, trust. And, you know, you think about this is that it's a different time. It, it's a different time now. We have to be there for everybody and not be afraid to have those conversations and not be afraid to make the bold moves because the, the internet's all around our children and we, we don't know what's, what they're learning or what, 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 what's happening on there. And we have to be there and that trusted voice for them to make and to be in these positions to make those decisions and support and, 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 and just be there for our children and, um, and, and you know, allow them that trusted voice and you know, having a, Having a daughter, uh, she's she's older now, and and um, you know I, I remember I remember those times and those difficult conversations and those I didn't want to have them I didn't know when to have them and I didn't know how to approach that but I realize now that it, it became more about communication and trust and and being there and I want to see see um, see all our all our um, kids be able to have a conversation with us and then support all our girls in this. So thank you very much for the mover and everyone who spoke to this. Thank you, Speaker. Honorable members, I've exhausted my list. Is there anyone else who would like to speak to the motion? If not, I'll go back to the mover of the motion to close debate, Charlottetown, Belvedere. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and a, a brief but very engaging debate, and I really appreciate that, you know, we can be efficient sometimes in here. <laughs> um, I, I appreciate as well the expression of support and the expansion of the, the conversation from both the ministers across the floor. I just take this chance, Mr. Speaker, to reiterate some of the key points on this, given that we now know that we have your support and that you do have a plan in place for delivering of women's health. There are multiple stages in this, this piece, um, and so absent or separate from the piece around education, I'm looking to the Minister of Health to make the commitment. That's expanding the scope of pharmacists for them to be able to, to prescribe directly oral contraceptives. It's to expand pharmacare to provide those oral contraceptives completely free of charge. It's to recognize that IUDs are the most effective form of contraception with the lowest lifetime cost, but they have the highest upfront cost. I'm asking you to add those to the formulary. And I'm asking you to recognize that youth who are under 18 should be able to access the services at the pharmacy as, a, as efficiently and as, and as equitably as any other person to be able to make informed choices about their bodily health. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I know the Minister of Health has a lot on his plate, but at the same time, there's some really good quick wins in here. Um, and, and I think having seen what we've seen recently with the expansion of PharmaCare delivery and services and the new funding agreement, I think you've laid the groundwork in a really great way to be able to sort of look at something that could be rolled out relatively quickly. I'd be more than happy to work with the Minister in any way I can to bring this forward. And my final piece, Mr. Speaker, I would add is keeping in mind the models that we see in other countries is that not only do we have the opportunity to provide these services through pharmacists, but community groups groups are another amazing partner who have trusted relationships. I'm thinking of Peers Alliance. I'm thinking of the newcomers or URSA. I'm thinking of, you know, those community partners that we know and love and trust who can also be enabling partners and empowering our women and women identifying people in PEI to actually achieve their reproductive rights. And that means making a choice. So thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you to the House for, the, for your support. And I look forward to your unanimous support on this motion. Thank you. Call the question. Honorable members, the question has been called. All those in favor of the motion, say yay. 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 Against, say nay. Honorable member, your motion passed unanimously. Mermaid Stratford, the opposition house leader. Mr. Speaker, I call motion 121. Shalop Carey. 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 Mr. Speaker, motion 121 is currently under debate, and debate was adjourned by the Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty and uh, third party house leader.
Well, it's a great pleasure to rise and speak about uh, this motion and others again that are uh, maybe very similar, but it's a good opportunity to get up and remind government. Every day it seems like there's more information that allows me to stay up here and continue mm -hmm. to keep talking. So, I mean, just, just yesterday we see that we, and again, just to remind uh, viewers uh, at home that haven't gone to, to do something else at this point, <laughs> just, to, just to remind them we're talking about valuing people and we're talking about trying to be there for people. And when, when people don't feel valued, much like that we're left out of a, a, a recruitment bonus or retention bonus, that, that, that what that means and how, how that makes them feel. And, and in the system, we're talking about porters, nutritional service workers, maintenance staff, you know, uh, respiratory therapists, and, and many others that one day all of a sudden they woke up, we talk about it, uh, this government being an, an, an evolution or a revolution, we're not doing a revolution, but one day they woke up and, and $8 million goes to some, and what goes to everybody else? Nothing, zero. Zero, and I mean, how do we how do we get to that point? And then just last night, like I said, just last night, you know, the health PEI has a has an annual general meeting, and and uh, you know, you think that, I mean, a little surplus here and there is not bad if you're government and stuff. You don't expect health PEI to have a surplus. You don't expect them to come in with a surplus. You you. <laughs> You, you, you want as much, as much support to our health care system as we can, but no, Health PEI comes up with a surplus yesterday and that matches, you know what that matches? That matches along with the government coming out with an $83 million surplus, Mr. Speaker. So between them both, they're running surpluses and there's all kinds of different things and I'm sure come the end of the year, there's some spending going on. Oh, we gotta spend. By 200, increase by 200 million. What's the point? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, do I have the floor? Yeah, you do. Oh, okay, okay, <laughs> thank you. Well, I, I mean, yeah, you're going to increase that, and you should increase that, but that's where health care is going. And you're also receiving a heck of a lot of money from the federal government to, to, oh, to, yeah. to, to oh, it's Minister. down, it's down. But you've, this government received 98 cent dollars during a two, or two and a half year COVID period. And what did they do with that money? What did they do with that money? They didn't give it to our allied health professionals, did they? No, no, they kept it. And they said, oh, we have an $83 million surplus. So the minister's coming at me and saying that the money from the federal government's down. You're, you're, you're not spending the money that you have. Like, give it back to the people that we need, minister. And that's what we're saying, is that both health PEI and then the government comes in with massive, massive, massive surpluses, and then our, our allied health care professionals get nothing. The respiratory therapists, they don't get anything. And you know, the, Mr. Speaker, I just sit over here and I'm like, uh, uh, three and a half years in, I finally know what I'm maybe doing. And, <laughs> and it took me that long, Mr. Speaker. No, but now I know. Now I can see the light, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> but you know who else hasn't figured it out? The government. They're, they're, they haven't figured it out. There's no plan. Uh, I mean, I can't imagine before they announced that, they woke up the day before and said, hey, let's give out some money because we have so much of it. But no, don't give it out to everybody. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. And then the argument said that it's a recruitment and retention bonus. Okay, if that's the argument. But when you give it out as that and not to other people's, guess what you're gonna do? Those other people will look elsewhere because they're in high demand. The whole system is in high demand. Whether you're a porter, whether you doesn't really, doesn't nutritional service workers, these jobs in Canada are in very high demand. And other provinces for respiratory therapists will come a knocking and we can't afford to lose respiratory therapists and others. And I'm, I'm looking at a handout, Mr. Speaker, and it's who are respiratory therapists. And we got this just before, I'm not sure all members got it, and it outlined what respiratory therapists do and how important they are. And, and it goes on, it, it says, for example, RTs care for newborns who are having difficulty breathing. Can we afford not to give them a, a, a bonus? They take care of newborns. I mean, uh, our population's growing, more births than prints around. We need respiratory therapists. We need to make sure we value that. When is it more important? 
They also take care of people of all ages who need respiratory services. And you know, you think back and you know, you have that little, when you go into the hospital, you have that little, that tube that you, you, you think, oh, I can, uh, Mr. Speaker, I can do that, no problem. I can, I can make that little ball in that tube. All you have to do is suck, and that, that ball goes up the tube, okay? And you think, hey, that's pretty easy. I can do that. Let's try to do that until you're sick, until you're struggling to breathe. And that becomes one of the hardest things that you could do. And who's there to help you get better? Respiratory therapists are. We need to make sure we humanize these positions and say thank you every single, every single day to them. Physiotherapists, um, respiratory therapists, nutrition, nutritional services, the people that make it comfortable in there when, when the lights go down in, in a long-term care facility and you're gonna try to have a peaceful rest. That's the people that we have to take care of. And you know, you, you, you look at something in your own speech from the throne. Well, first of all, I don't understand this line. Nobody has explained this to me in government. And I'm gonna just, just give me, it says an expansion and enhancement will be made to our care at home program, which enables virtual long-term care. I don't understand that. How do you do virtual long-term care? I don't, I don't know. I don't know, I still don't know, and I still wasn't explained. That's in there. But then it moves on to say, and our restorative care program will be expanded and enhanced. It says it right here in the speech from the throne from two years ago. Expanded and enhanced. Who is there? Who is there taking care of people for restorative care programs? Well, nobody now, because this government's cut the whole restorative care program. Not true. Not true, but there's, there are some beds in Summerside. You're absolutely right. But you cut it in half, Minister. Mm -hmm. You cut it in half because you cut 12 beds at Prince P P E Hill. And, and I know that to be factual. And I'm disappointed because restorative care, who works in restorative care? Yes, doctors come in and check people, but who works in restorative care to get people better? And that's health promotion. And that's health promotion, Minister. But nope, guess who doesn't get a bonus? Everybody that works there restorative care programs. There might be some, there's, there's some nurses and, and you know, and, and they, they, they deserve the bonuses, RNs deserve the bonuses, that whole ram, everybody does, got the bonuses, deserve it, but I'm just worried about how that, how that crushes, how, how that crushes the core of the team. And, and there's an opportunity because these motions and from this side of the house, we've come together to say, hey, you know what? We see this as a gap. And I, I know the minister wants to get up and speak. And you know, I might let him speak. I'd love to hear. Would you love to hear? Oh, you'd love to hear him speak. And I will be wrapping this up. But yeah, I'm gonna give him about three minutes. You better, you better be good, Minister. <laughs> but this is just an example, and and I, I want you to know, but this is the consequence of not planning a decision. You you, you need to plan these things out. You need to, to look at our system where it is now and where it's going. And I've looked at the information from the AGM and there's a lot of gaps that are, that are, that are in there and a lot of things on a, uh, you know, explaining the system and how we need staff and we need, we need to value them right now. And when you do, and hopefully you do, make a decision to I don't even know if that's a reversal of the decision. Do you come to your senses and make sure you value these people? And it's a, it's a, it, I, I hope you do. When you do that, you remember this side of the house minister and, and because I think that our system is broken right now and we don't want in here add to that. We want to make it whole. And so remember that minister and I, I'm really glad to be able to speak to this, this motion here today and I think it's a very important one. So thank you, I uh, pass the floor. The Honourable Member from Larry Inverness, third oh, party left. Yeah, no, well, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, I, I know, I, I don't want to waste a lot of good material here, Mr. Speaker, but but I have to say that this motion has been a motion as I look at it, and uh, you know it certainly has a, a really a lot of potential. I like this motion, Mr. Speaker. But I, but I'm going to get on to a little bit about uh, some things. And I was just looking at the uh, the annual report a little bit about uh, health PEI last night, and I and I was trying to look at it. And I sort of said, 
what's less and what's more here? And I want to give a complete encapsulation here. When I look down over some of the numbers of employees, less nurses, RNs, LP, and RCWs, less th than the year before. The one thing that was more, more administration and management, oh, Mr. Speaker. More of them, less frontline workers. Facts, that these are the numbers. These are health PEI, the minister's own numbers, Mr. Speaker. Less lab technicians, less clerical and secretarial support, less utility workers, and less other health professionals and support staff. These are his own numbers. <laughs> but he'll, they'll stand up every time. We got more of this, we got more of that, we get more when you were there. Just because you say it doesn't make it so, Mr. Speaker. You have to have the evidence there, Mr. Speaker. So, so then I start to then I then I start to look a little bit of what else is more. So let's let's look at what's more. Let's look at just patient stays, patient days, more patient days, more people in the hospital, Mr. Speaker. Uh, alternate alternate level of care, patient days, more again, Mr. Speaker. I can go on a little bit more. Average long-term care total bed, 60% are awaiting long-term care of the beds available. 60%, Mr. Speaker. Phenomenal numbers. You got more of them? Good on you, Minister, for that. Uh, emergency department of visits, more of them, Mr. Speaker, and up significantly more on them. Average length of stay, more again. More of them, Mr. Speaker. And number of lab tests, way more of them. The point I'm trying, uh, the point I'm trying to make here, less staff, significantly less staff, and way more services they're trying to deliver, which is the point <laughs> that we were trying to make, Mr. Speaker. I would like to adjourn debate, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> and, uh, I'll, I'll adjourn debate on this, this particular motion, Mr. Speaker, uh, seconded by the, the member from Tignish Palmer Road. <laughs> Honourable members, the question has been asked to extend the hour. Do we have it? No. Oh. <laughs> Honourable members, the hour is called. The Honourable member from Morrell, Dona, and the opposition House Leader. Thank you, Minister. Or thank you, Mr. Speaker. That's too bad. He was just getting on a roll there. I know. Mr. Speaker, I move, seconded by the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure, this House adjourn until November 18th at uh, 10 o'clock in the end. Short carry. Carry. Uh, it's great to be laughing again, members. <laughs>